episode number 227 with Carlos Welch and Andrew Brokus. Welcome to the Heads Up Poker Podcast. This is Steve Barton. And this is Mike. How are you doing, Stevie? I'm doing quite well. How are you doing, sir? Eh, everything considered, I guess I'm doing okay. I don't yeah. like sitting around staring at the wall, contemplating exactly how non-essential I am. <laughs> the depth non-essential of people like me have to, Yeah, non-essential people like me have to stay inside while apparently essential people like you can prance a dance around the streets. I don't know what you're doing out there, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> fornicating with hazmat suits on I, I i don't i don't even know what's going on out there yeah it's uh it's crazy man uh we started wearing uh, masks on every single call now okay. uh so we're fully uh bubble suited up and everything not not actually on air on our scbas or anything but uh every medical call we're wearing a uh wearing a mask and our glasses okay uh, gloves of course you know have you guys been tested no we haven't which surprises me um, maybe there's just not enough testing units, but, uh, they did personal issue a thermometer to each one of us. And, uh, if we have a temperature, so when we go into work, if we have a temperature of a hundred, I think it's a hundred point four or above, then we're sent home. Okay. Steve. Um, so they are taking some active measures. Yeah. Lots happened since the last uh, show. I feel like, um, um, I can't remember. I think we were just starting to, uh, worry about the virus a little bit. But uh, we hadn't had the quarantine or any of the, any of the widespread <coughs> chaos, I guess you can call it. Yeah, yeah. My card room was still open. That place is closed now. Apparently, all the casinos in Vegas are closed. <laughs> Your card room's closed. Um, it, uh, have you been? Pardon me. Yeah, it, just, it sounds like you're coming down with the uh, first COVID cough here. The first cough of the year here just happens <laughs> to be Steve. You're witnessing it. My my demise. <laughs> I guess we're supposed to take some comfort in, um, you know, I'm turning 50 this year, so I'm not as young as you, but the chances of us dying from this seem to be um, relatively small or low. But, um, you know, I, uh, my mother is 70, let me see, 72 now. Okay. And she has had major, she's had breast, um, breast cancer. She's had CPO or COPD. How do you say COPD. Yeah, major respiratory issues. Yeah. So she's the sort of person, if she catches this, um, the chances of surviving are very, very, very slim. Um, she's doing everything she can. She's locked into her house. Not She does not want family visiting. She does not let other people in her house. I saw this once a week. She, uh, I think, well, uh, twice since all this began, she's gone grocery shopping, you know, gloves, uh, mask, everything, you know. But I don't know. Yeah, it's kind of surreal. I went to the grocery store the other day, and uh, they made you wait outside. You had to stand six feet apart, and uh, they only let a few people in the store at a time. It was uh, kind was of long. surreal. How long was the line outside? Uh, there was maybe 12 or 15 of us. They were probably letting 15 people in the store at once. Um, it was Trader Joe's, so not a huge grocery store, but still. Um, yeah, it's kind of different. It, uh, I was talking with my folks about it, and... Uh, you know, since I'm afraid I might have made a little light of uh, of the COVID on our last show, uh, but since I've learned more about it, this is uh, really kind of unprecedented, you know, right. for the world, um, at least in anyone's. I wouldn't worry history. about making a light, Steve. You've you've lowered the bar so much into understanding <laughs> the the pulse of what is going on around you that people will not. <laughs> my purposeful lack of uh, being informed so and just blatant your, ignorance your, your your parents listened to the podcast and were like uh steve this is serious business no no they've just listened to me talk and uh, i don't think they've heard our last show since uh, i've talked to them. maybe they have i don't know uh but um they uh they were like you know this is you know you, you young whippersnappers are lucky because you're probably going to get it. You might you know, not even be symptomatic, you know, but uh, the older uh, generation, it could be fatal. I'm like, eh, you got a good point. I hadn't really thought about it from. Uh... Um, yeah, I don't know. Uh, well, first of all, who do we have on today? Do we have, we have Andrew and okay. Carlos. 
Double barreled. Okay. Yes. Dynamic wow. duo. Yeah. Jeez, I don't know if I'm prepared for this, Steve. I honestly wasn't entirely sure. I'm going to, uh, I had my coffee. Hopefully we, we rise to the occasion here. <laughs> Maybe the intelligent people can have a little, you know, though, I'd like to be one of those people that says, I think, I mean, I think both sides are right. I mean, we, maybe we should just save this. There really is a decision to be made here. There's only so long we can not be on the street before the economy collapses. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I mean, if, if 25, but you know, especially I've got to, you know, who wants to make those decisions? I mean, like my brother's like, well, it's either let a million people die or watch the country go absolutely to hell. Where yeah. maybe more than a people die just fighting for water and you know all this such shit. I, I I don't know. It's probably it's not that dramatic of a thing. You know, we've got to stay inside a, a little longer. But at some point, I mean, I would be a prime example of someone who's uh, who's pretty fucked if I have to sit sit in a home much longer. I, I'm a, I'm going a little stir crazy. I got to be uh, honest. Uh, I, I haven't been letting it stop me from getting out on the trails and running. Um, there's a lot of people out. Uh, as far as like outside, you know, nobody can go in restaurants or anything, but right. there's a lot of people out at the beach, uh, at the parks and on the trails. And well, as long as your quads are uh, nice and taut, Steve, I guess that's the important thing right now. Is what you're saying? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <It's>, <laughs> I don't know. But when they, when Newsom was shut, basically shut down the state said, you know, he said 60% of us will be infected by May 1st. And, wow. um, yeah, now they're basically saying more than half the country, and um, I don't, I, you know, again, I don't know. Somehow, it's weird that we know the crisis is coming. I mean, I don't know if we. It's hard to come up with analogies here, but it's like you know the Titanic. Okay, the ice. If you knew the icebergs up there, five miles ahead of time, you're not going to hit it. So here we know it's coming, but we still we don't have enough ventilators. Um, we don't have enough hospital beds. We don't have enough hospital. So if we are indeed headed towards these, this thing is just going to keep climbing and climbing and climbing for like at least six weeks or so. Then, um, yeah, I mean, obviously it's terrifying and it's going to be, um, it's going to be tough. The governor of uh, New York just did a press conference. I guess that the federal government is sending 400 ventilators and he said, we need 30,000. Oh, wow. So, um, you're talking about massive shortage shortages in Italy. If I remember correct, they stopped ventilating people. They had to make decisions and anyone over the 60 age of 60 stopped getting the ventilator because their chances of surviving were less other than the younger person. Hmm. So uh, I'm glad I'm not a hospital administrator or whatever, whoever uh, head nurse shift doctor. And so yeah, I would not want to be making these decisions. Yeah. Yeah. When someone on the 80 year old ventilator, even if they're, you know, even if they're in hospice care or whatever, or only have six months to live, you know, I mean, you have to take the ventilator, I guess, and certain sick, but often to give it to the 55 year old who can survive if they use it. I, don't, I mean, I don't know. Yeah. Triage. We're not used to these. We're, we're a country that thinks this is, uh, you know, there's a solution to every problem. You know what I mean? Well, op optimism is our national character, I guess you'd say. I don't know. But, uh, <laughs> you're a true American, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> I'm a I'm a true Muscovite. I would be I would probably be a, yeah the darker corners of the globe with a a riper sense of tragedy. But um, <laughs> yeah, uh, I don't I don't I don't know, Steve. Yeah, this is obviously uh, I assume will be the topic of today, and we have some people who are uh, smarter than us, so we can get a uh, better idea. But uh, I think by the end of the show, we'll at least come up with several solutions. I, I'm skeptical about that. <laughs> Carlos is might involve. We all dig a hole in the desert and there's just not enough shovels to go around either. Yeah. Yeah. Or, or, or nip mobiles. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so when you, when you say you're getting uh, cabin fear, stir crate, I mean, you're still going to work every day. Well, I've been off work now for, this is day four. I go back tomorrow and I got a feeling I'm going to be there for quite a while. I haven't checked in to see if anybody's gone home with the flu, but I mean, if they're taking our temperature as soon as we walk in the door, then uh, I think um, it's only a matter of time before guys are going to start getting quarantined and the rest of us that haven't caught it yet will be stuck there. So <clears throat> we'll see. We'll see. It, uh, yeah, I don't know. 
kind of crazy times, crazy times. Yeah. Well, at least you're essential. That's good for the ego. (laughs) (laughs) If nothing else, my ego's fed. (laughs) I am fortunate in this. I was talking with my buddy in that, uh, just through, uh, I guess, blind ass luck. My profession is one of those that uh, really can't, um, is kind of essential. And so I'm fortunate that uh, I still get to work and I'm going to be getting a paycheck. There's a lot of people that they got sent home and they're sitting at home right now, not earning a dime, you know? Um, yeah. You're one of them. I mean, again, it, Steve, you know, we've argued politics, economics, not to get into this, but there's a large part of the population where even missing like three days of work means like rent couldn't get paid. Yeah. I mean, and um, yeah, this is a game changer forever here. Like there's all sorts of people I was having on buddy. There's all sorts of people now using Amazon prime for the first time. We've never used it. It's hmm. kind of a generational thing. You know, people over 50 probably don't use it. Yeah. Um, they're getting stuff delivered through Amazon prime. Are, are they going to go back to the shopping malls when the economy recovers? I mean, these are jobs that are never coming back. I'm saying. Yeah. Like yeah. when, like Kohl's, for example, was already having all sorts of problems. They just shut their 1,100 stores down completely during this time. I mean, they may never come back, and God only knows how many employees they have. You know what I mean? So, uh, yeah, the, it's like it's just different. Like a, you know, earthquake or a major fire, um, you know what to do. We try to help those who are in pain, and then we rebuild. Yeah. And here we don't know what sort of um, scars and damage this is going to do in all sorts of uh, different ways. Yeah. True. 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 It'll How's be your stock portfolio, Steve? When are you jumping back in there? I uh, well, I looked at the market today. Uh, S and P five hundred is up by seven percent. I think the last I checked. Uh, today's an up day. Uh, yesterday was definitely a down day. Uh, but I was talking with uh, a few of the investments that we've made uh, in the last week or so are starting to um, um, inch up a profit. I mean, some of these are just like. Man, I mean, it's jumping 15, 20, 30% in a day or the other way going down. You know, it's like um, I kind of want to wait for this to uh, stabilize just a little bit before I put more into it. But I'm still of the mind that now is a great time to buy. And I've got my retirement portfolio in a in a uh, fixed income. It's a 3.6% guaranteed. And I'm just waiting until it looks like this is going to kind of at least even out and then I can dump it back into the market. But everything new that I'm putting into the market, I'm putting, um, um, I'm putting into the S and P 500. It's, uh, it's just lost, you know, so much of its value. I I think Steve, you're the investor class, if I maybe call you that and not, not even in a uh, derogatory manner. I, I, like I said, just going along, I think there's going to be some major changes here. Did you see like, I mean, if none of these guys go to prison, it's going to be terrible. Did you see these these five U.S. senators? They had a meeting, you know, closed door meeting, whatever, like a month and a half ago about the virus. Yeah, they got a hot tip. <laughs> it's also well, insider not trading. Only, I think the senator from Georgia literally went out and sold like a million dollars in stock that day. So, <laughs> right. <laughs> I mean, it's just not funny. And what what makes it worse, though, because I guess I don't know if the consensus was let's try to keep people positive. We don't want the economy to take a dive. So not only they're selling stock, they're tweeting out, we're stronger than ever. We, you know, don't worry, America, your government loves you, you know, blah, blah, blah. I mean, those people need to be punished. Um, I don't know. I I don't know. 1.5 trillion, much of it is essentially going to save industries. It's it's to help the stock market. Let's be honest. Like that's what the entire point of government is. I mean, with slight exaggeration. So it's like, okay, don't worry, the cruise lane industries, the airline. So 1.5 trillion, Steve, that's I think $5,000 for every single person out there. Wouldn't that make, I mean, I guess we're gonna maybe do both. Wouldn't that make that be maybe the first thing you do? Everybody stay home, here's a check. I mean, what's, yeah. it seems to make a lot more sense. I think, let, let's put it this way. When this happens 10 years from now, it won't be a debate. People are not gonna even worry about the airline industry. When it's all over, some people are going to have be saving their money and they're going to go on a cruise right afterwards. And some people ain't, I'm quoting myself from one of my many tweets regarding this here. <laughs> I'm getting, but uh, much of our political leadership is really um, appalling, I think. But uh, you can say, you can, the whole, you can say the same thing about much of the world, you know, England, a lot of places just not prepared for this, you know, what I mean? sure. so you don't maybe point 
specifically at our man in the White House, but he's, uh, I don't know, Steve, he's pretty amazing. Did you see the press conference where the, uh, the NBC reporter is like, what do you say to the Americans out there that are still nervous? He's like, I'd tell them you're a terrible reporter. Yes. <laughs> I saw that one. I was like, oh my God. I mean, Steve, this is like something out of a fucking David Lynch movie. I know. I, I, it's it, surrealism is the, but I, I don't know. That's the resources of the government are creaking along. And like some of the, some of these things are just, I don't know if we, uh, yeah, we should immediately stop building whatever, whatever aircraft carrier when we're is half built, like all that money should be going towards getting ventilators, you know, but whatever. yeah. Yeah. What time? What time are these guys coming on, anyways? Uh, right now, let's take a quick break, and we'll bring in uh, Carlos and Andrew. Okay, Andrew, throw in the uh, transitional music here. Well, Carlos and Andrew, thank you guys for coming on the show. Thank you. Happy to be here. I'm looking forward to it. I've I've never for all the podcasting I've done with Carlos, I don't think we've ever both been guests at the same time. No. No. Well, you've you've both been on this one, but never at the same time. So if you haven't done that on a podcast at all together, then that's pretty so cool. All those Yankee fans who never got to see Mantle and Bit Maris bat in the same game, we're, we're coming through here. <laughs> Steve and I just had <laughs> Steve and I just had a spirited argument. I should tell you, like I said, Steve, let's get some uh, smartest guys we know to maybe offer a little guidance through these challenging times. And he said, fuck mm-hmm. you. I'm bringing on Andrew and Carlos. So hello. <laughs> <laughs> so how are you guys holding up? Are you guys both uh, locked down quarantined? I am. I am. Um, yeah. I mean, I, I, I don't want to speak for Carlos, but I think we're probably in a similar boat where like, we're both not that, social people to begin with so the like locking down right. part is, has not been that big of a sacrifice and um for me at least like i'm pretty well equipped to work from home uh, i've played a little bit of online poker but most of what i'm doing right now is like working on the book coaching um nate and i are about to finish up another set of uh premium podcasts so you know, there's a fair bit that i can do without leaving the house which is sort of how i prefer to live anyway <laughs> yeah <laughs> and, speaking of men now, like isolation uh, <laughs> I, I already had a three month supply of beans and rice before this started. So. <laughs> <laughs> you, you're not one of the ones standing in line at Costco then? No, not at all. Yeah. Although right Carlos's <laughs> idea of self quarantine is a little like he's the only one here who probably has a hazmat suit and is running over toddlers to get into 7 Eleven and get the last roll of toilet paper. You know, the rest. <laughs> <laughs> So, Carlos, you're still in – you specifically were looking for a low-population place. Um, there, you still could get the amenities. Is Are you still in Arizona, I guess, my question. Sorry. Yes. Yes, the, Bullhead City. Uh, basically, the city that um, Alex and I used to live in together, it actually <laughs> works perfectly for a pandemic. <laughs> Pandemic proof. Yes. What uh, what what's so nice about it? Uh, perfect for the pandemic is everything spread out. Everyone stays indoors, anyways. Or? Um, it's pretty low population distance um, density, and also easy access to like a Walmart. So it's not as um, is not as safe as being like in the middle of the desert. But at least you have access to Walmart. Um, and, um, if we, obviously we don't know this yet, but if it holds that this thing becomes less contagious as the temperature increases, it's pretty good to be in a place where the average daily temperature is like 110 in the summer. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. They, didn't, they didn't have to cancel uh-huh. Mardi Gras in Bullhead City. No, there wasn't. There was. Yeah. So quickly, I don't know if everyone just wants to uh, just listening to the news today. Of course, we have the partisan. It seems like both sides are giving like the Republicans. Let's get back to work. It's the only answer. Um, And the Democrats, let's take care of everyone. I mean, aren't they both kind of right? I mean, if we're quarantined for three months, doesn't aren't we looking at 
I mean, how much money can the government print to, to make sure we can all pay our rent? Aren't we kind of fucked if we do that? And obviously, if we go back to work, uh, a lot of people are going to die because of that. Yeah, I mean, to be honest, I haven't been following it super closely because um, I don't feel like my following it um, actually affects things okay. all that much. <laughs> Um, I do. Th I mean, I will say, like the, the main thing I've been arguing with people about on social media is not so much what should be done as much as like how people are interpreting this kind of. Um, I don't even think gridlock's fair to call it because it's not like they've had a lot of time to to hammer out a plan. But I think there's a, a sort of like easy but wrong um, argument again. Like it's just it's so easy to hate right. on politicians and just say, oh, politicians, they're, you know, they're worthless. They can't agree on anything. They're all just blah, blah, blah. and like. It's not entirely wrong, but <laughs> in that, you know, like this is, there is a process to this and like, yeah, we all wish that they could just um, sort of like arrive at a magical solution that would make everything better. But the truth is obviously like, we're going to disagree as a country. And I mean, that disagreement is going to happen largely along like the party lines that pretty much everything seems to happen along these days. Um, but like, there's not consensus on what is the thing that they should unite behind. So it's easy to be like, oh yeah, why don't they just like come together and solve the problem? But of course the tricky part is like, well, what should that solution be? And so, you know, like it, it's going to be a negotiation and until there's a, uh, a compromise that's reached, there's, it's not going to look like we're close, right? It's not going to be like, oh, well, they keep taking votes and like it goes from being uh, uh, whatever it is, 60-40 to 58-42 to 56-44. Like that's it's not the way it works. I mean, the, the real, um, I mean, obviously I would encourage people uh, to, to like follow Mac Glassman on, on Twitter and listen to some of the interviews that we've done with him. Um, if you want to understand this stuff better, I'm really just sort of like channeling what I think he would likely say <laughs> in this situation. But um, it's, it's, I mean, there, there's a deal that's being hammered out among the leadership um, and, you know, they're kind of trying to find whatever compromise they can. Like they both have an incentive to get something done because it is unpopular that they're doing nothing. So like they, they do have like the mutual incentive of getting something done and then they have the competing incentives of what should that thing be? And, you know, they're going to try to find a way of getting something done that they can both live with and sell to their constituents. And once they reach that agreement, then they're all going to tell the members of their parties like, okay, now here's the thing you can vote for. And then suddenly we're going to have like a very popular bill. So it's like, it, it's not like these individual votes are just happening um, in a vacuum or something, right? There, there's sort of unified negotiating parties and uh, you're not going to see, I think, a lot of dissension. So it's like a, a meme I've been seeing a lot on Facebook is like, oh, 100% of the Democrats voted against this thing. And so, yes, because the Democratic leadership's not on board with it yet because it's like mostly a Republican plan. And, you know, once there's more of a compromise, then we're going to see like quite a few people voting for it. And like maybe a few people in like certain very specific swing states are like given permission not to vote for it. But again, like that usually comes from the party leadership. It's not like a rogue thing where, where a person is just like voting his conscience and the leadership is like, what? He voted how? Right. You know, like they usually um, know that this stuff is, is happening. Yeah, yeah, my my take on the whole thing, like I kind of had an epiphany, an epiphany this morning, where like a, a lot of this is dependent on not the millennials, but the Gen Xers, as Gen Zers, which um, would be the age group just below, um, like teens and like um, early twenties. It's dependent on that group, and also on politicians and I just came to the epiphany that neither one of these groups cares whether I live or die. And so <laughs> a, a good portion of them anyway. And so for that reason, I just decided that I'm going to self isolate probably longer than most people. And I, I I'm getting to the point where because I feel so out of control, so helpless in terms of what other people do. I'm just going to do my part at this point. I'm just thinking like, man, save yourself. Right. So that that's what I'm yeah. doing. Well, to give Carlos some praise here, you seem to be had a pinch of hysteria in your tweeting long before a lot of people like you thought, do you think, is that just your, your nature or were you right away? getting online doing a little research and saying, man, we're, we, this fucking country's not ready. 
Yeah, um, primarily because, uh, like, normally I don't, like, keep up with um, infectious diseases, but just the, the <laughs> exponential <laughs> nature. That's your favorite topic? <laughs> no, no, it's not something that I, like, I don't, honestly, I don't even know if I knew about the 1918 flu six months ago. Right. <laughs> but but just the exponential nature of this, I think just kind of like piqued my interest um, as a math guy. And mm. when I saw how crazy this could get, and I haven't actually been meaning to do my research on this um, to, up, to update my research, but I remember when this thing first happened, they were talking about, oh, the uh, infection rate is doubling every week. And I'm thinking like, man, that's kind of like, crazy uh, in terms of um you know the the exponential nature of it and then it got to a point where it was doubling twice a week and then it was like tripling and um uh, now i think it's actually accelerating faster than that and i haven't like updated to see exactly like what the current doubling rate is but it's not looking good so it's interesting, um, just the, the numbers wise is interesting, but um, I think that was, to answer your question, Mike, that was the thing that kind of like piqued my interest is like looking at the worst case scenario. Um, that was something that caught my attention pretty early. Now, without being maybe too explicit, you've, we talked about how a couple of people started a conversation about it's for the older people and you're like, and people who are middle-aged with pre-existing conditions. Are you, not to give your whole health history, other than, I mean, do you have high blood yes. pressure? Do you have? Yes. I, I, I'm an 80-year-old man as far as this thing is concerned. Okay. <laughs> so <laughs> I'm, taking, I'm taking my precautions. I do have high blood pressure. In fact, um, I read uh, that, that could potentially be one of the bigger um, 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 risk factors is um, high blood pressure. So yeah, I'm definitely taking this serious as far as my own health. Hmm. Now, have you actually, I don't know, obviously we're all dealing with unknowns here, but I don't know, do you have any like, is predictions the right word of how, we already said we got a, not enough hospital beds, not enough ventilators, and there's basically no way to, to slow this down at the present moment. Is that a fair synopsis? I don't know. Uh, we 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 promised the uh, listener just before you guys came on that we were going to solve this uh, COVID by the end of this show. So. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I got the solution are... I already. I mean, we could wrap it up now. I already gave the solution. <laughs> Assume that you have it. Problem solved. <laughs> Assume that you have it. Assume that everyone else has it, and then stay inside. That's yes. it. <laughs> That's the best we can do. Right on. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. You, we joke about it, but you're probably absolutely right. That's the, that's the best thing that that can be done. Yeah, I mean, just because it's funny doesn't mean it's a joke. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. I was talking about Steve. I'm mildly uh, filled with self-loathing that I'm just so inessential. That's the word that Gavin Newsom used in California. And Steve immediately just jumped out of his door that day and jumped in his car and went out to help people. And I just said, "Okay, you're right." Okay, Bolt Mike, the door. I got some. I got. I got something for you, Mike. <laughs> I kind of felt the same way, but this is something that I heard, haven't heard a lot of people talk about. So uh, I might just take up the flag on this one. Just talk about it every chance I get. Um, there's gonna be an enormous need for blood, and there's already shortages. So <laughs> if you're able to donate blood, that makes everybody essential. So do that if you can, because they can't, they, they don't have a way of feeling that need if we don't step to the plate. It's probably best to do it now, as opposed to like a month from now when it's really going to be a big deal. Right. Yeah. So that's what I'm going to do. And then after that, you know, hey, my hands are clean. I'm done. Yeah. <laughs> I've done my part. You can only get <laughs> once every 56 days. So I'll get it out of the way now. And then like, you know, nobody can blame me when, you know, hell freezes over. 
Oh, you got it down to the day. I was going to say once every two months or so, but uh, you would have beat me by four days there. I've been doing my research. <laughs> Apparently. <laughs> <laughs> we promised a solution here and we're getting one by God. Yeah. Where's your mind at <laughs> mentally with diet? Are you like, well, this is fuck this all. I'm going to eat nothing but Snickers here this, in this crisis. Or are you kind of the other way? Like, this is, a, this is an opportunity to get serious about my health. It's so. I, I literally just had cookie level. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is this is so like a mind fuck in that regard. Because on the one hand, especially for a guy like me whose main uh, vulnerability to this thing is my health, you would think this would be like the biggest motivation of all time to get healthier. But at the same time, it's hard to do that when you're a sugar addict and there's a lot to be worried about right now. Like if, 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 if there was any a time for comfort eating, it would be during a pandemic. Uh, so I bought two weeks worth of food, which I thought it was going to be two weeks worth, but I didn't factor in like pandemic equity. <laughs> so, I think, <laughs> so I think I may have eaten. You're at day two and a half right now and you need to go back. <laughs> yeah. I think I may have eaten like a week's a two weeks worth of food and one week. Um, but I definitely stocked, I, I definitely stocked up on the, um, uh, healthier plant-based options and it's a mix. <laughs> I'm throwing those in, <laughs> I'm throwing those in with the cookies. <laughs> I've definitely noticed I, I normally eat healthy six days a week and then I have one cheat day a week and, uh, uh, I'm definitely going like cheat meals much more often now. I just had a pizza last night and uh, I had one delivered two days before that, which I normally would never do. But I, it's almost like a comfort eating, I think. Just being inside, you're kind of like, yeah, I don't know how else to describe it. It's like comfort eating. Yeah. 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 What, uh, what do you guys think about the WSOP? Is there any chance, is there a snowball's chance in hell that's going to kick off? Or we, Maybe in October. I'm still in denial. Maybe in October. You think? Are they, have they talked about doing that, post, postponing it? Or? It's about the worst place you can have people coming from 100 countries over there. And, you know, if you're going to catch the coronavirus, I think that would absolutely be the best way to do it. Good year to get a bracelet, <laughs> yep. though, if all the euros are locked out. <laughs> I mean, everyone just changing chips and cards, every single hand, people eating at the table, like in a confined space in that confined room. I mean, it was, uh, I really don't think there'd be any better way to do it. That's basically what New York is, right? Just. Uh, a place where people kind of converge from all over the world. I think that's part of the reason why they are at the levels that they are. So, yeah. so I'm not going to be, I mean, I was, again, I was built for this. I wasn't really interested in live poker anyway. So <laughs> if it happens yeah. in October, I won't be there. Right. Let me ask, let yeah. me ask you guys a question. Yeah. Cause I, I know the answer for Carlos. Have you guys seen the wire? Uh, just what? the first season. Okay, I don't think this was in the first season. Uh, Steve, the Wire. The Liar. No, no I have the Wire. No, he hasn't. Oh, the Wire. Uh, damn, I think I saw the first season a long time ago. Ah, you guys are so disappointed. But, uh, well, anyway, Carlos. <laughs> <laughs> the second season is so densely plotted. It's like I think you got to watch like four episodes of it. Yeah, I, I think so that was. I, I was busy working and I I got lost. Hey, a bit yeah, I the, the you can watch it now. Tricky one. Yeah, that's true. That's true. <laughs> I think it is Amazon Prime right now. Sweet. Um, okay. Anyway, sorry, I, Andrew has a question. Yes. And anytime I hear pan, well, so you guys know the, the basic premise of the, the show is it sort of follows uh, drug dealers and then also like detectives who are trying sure. to disrupt their their network. Um, so one of the things that they're uh, that the, the dealers are, are doing is they have names for the product that they're selling just to try to differentiate themselves from their competitors. And anytime I hear the word pandemic, uh, I just imagine, I think it was Bodhi out, got that pandemic, got that pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> that was the name for one of their drugs was pandemic. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that's, that's hysterical. <laughs> <laughs> you uh without hesitation andrew someone asked about which poker player would you want to be locked up with and of course you said carlos i mean was uh did he get any help from nate or anybody like <laughs> that, that you should uh um i mean nate would be high on that list as well but okay. uh, they're they're both good roommates i've i've lived with both of them for some for some period of time um 
Carlos is like, in addition to being one of my better friends, um, just an extreme, and I think uh, Mike at least will know this, like just an extremely easy person to share space with. Like there's, there's True. zero drama. There's zero, um, I don't know, like he's, he's, he's mostly fun to have around, but even when he's not feeling in a social mood, like he doesn't take up any space. He doesn't like ask anything of you. At least uh, mental space. <laughs> You don't though. That's what I'm saying. Like I don't. Um, it's like it's easy to forget you're there when, uh, when 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 you're trying to be forgotten, and then you know it's it's nice to have you around when you're in the mood to be around. It's just like no dope, no hookers, and he take he's nice to my couch. So, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I, I appreciate that. Thank you. How long was it? I mean, um, I guess this is going back. I don't know if you want to get back to like the first time you ran into Carlos, you know, personally, was he, did you guys become friends pretty quick? I mean, was he just like this interesting, weird character who listened to your show and had some cool stories? Sure. Yeah. So we, we met at this, uh, tournament poker edge meetup and, um, he, you know, he, he's not the sort to, to brag about himself at all. So I kind of had to like wheedle this information out of him, but he would just like drop these little interesting nuggets where he'd said like, Oh yeah. Like that time that I went to, um, the time that I went to Cherokee and, and slept in my truck. And I was like, what? Back up. <laughs> <laughs> to hear more about that story. <laughs> Hang on. These, these, um, these, these little nuggets, I guess like overall the thing that I respected most was that he was out there to play single table satellites which are you know especially then but probably still now are um one of like softest things that you can play in las vegas during the the wsop yeah. and um he was he was like making good money at them was, i mean I, I believe obviously like you have to a little bit of grain of salt when a poker player tells you they're winning but like he has a lot of credibility to him so like it was plausible what he was telling me and like how well he was doing in them and then what i really respected was that he was 100 percent just flipping the lammers like he, he never took the lammers and bought into a wsop event which i think like you know 95 at least percent of poker players even if they went out there with that plan of like okay i know my bankroll only allows me to play single table satellites i'm just going to play these single table satellites if they won enough of them if they won you know 30 or 40 of these things as carlos had probably done by that point they're probably going to say to themselves it's not like oh i i can i can play one i can play one main event uh not like the main event but like a 1500 or whatever right um, yeah, and and he just never did that. He was just like, no, this is what I came out here to do. This is what it makes sense for me to do, and I'm going to do this. And like that by itself is just like such a rare trait, and like an important trait too. So I mean, it's it's both interesting and I think um, illustrative for for our audience of like this is the kind of mindset that you need to have if you want to be a successful professional. And like you don't have to be um, playing 10ks or whatever to make a living at poker. If you can find a game that you can beat and have the discipline to to put your nose to the grindstone and, and stick to it. So we booked him for the podcast. Like, I mean, I, mean, I just, uh, I, I think I probably asked him first or, you know, got, got his, um, he agreed to come on the show and I just like called Nate. I was like, okay, you got to meet this guy. <laughs> I just, I yeah. think we, we recorded like two hours later and uh, I think we all enjoyed doing it. I don't remember if we hung out much more that summer, but, um, you know, we definitely wanted to keep having him on the show after that. Yeah, that I remember him coming on the show, and uh, I remember I first met you, Carlos, through TPE. I guess that's how we all met. Um, and uh, I remember there was a post that I think Doug Lyford or, or maybe Jacob put up that you had won a, uh, a Bovada tournament, and you were you were sitting there. You took a picture of yourself in front of your computer with your sunglasses on, holding up the two cards that you won the tournament with. <laughs> and, you, and it was like, "Hey, this this guy Carlos has been crushing these tournaments. <laughs> Check it out!" And they sent the picture, and I click on the link, and I see the picture, and I'm like, "Well, this can't be right." because he's not Mexican. And uh, so I go back and I'm like, maybe the link is wrong. And I click on it and I'm like, oh no, I guess it is. His name is Carlos. Okay. <laughs> Who is this guy? <laughs> yeah, that, that, that was a funny picture. I think I took that picture after I won the, um, the Bavada major that year. And I had like some, um, like a chip set. So I basically set up like my own winner's pick and, uh, yes. And I had like the two cards I wanted to turn. Actually, I used seven two soft offsuit as a joke. And, oh. it was, and instead of, uh, I had like um, in front of the chip set, I had a um, five dollars off an all change coupon set up <laughs> in my winner's pick. 
uh, so yeah, that that was a that was a good one. Now, it was. now, now Andrew may have forgotten this, uh, or maybe we have a little bit of a um, disagreement on like when we first met. But I'm pretty sure we met before the meetup, but that was when we just really got a chance to sit down and talk. But I came to rail Andrew when he was playing, and I remember oh, I this specifically. Remember this. It was that tournament. I think they only ran it once, but it was called the Mix Max, Mix, Mix Max tournament. And I it do was, remember that. So it was Andrew at the table. I want to say Faraz Jaka, and mm-hmm. also uh, Vanessa Selps. So <laughs> so so I came up and just like basically I came to Vegas that year, and I just wanted to like you know meet the TPE guys. So I found out Andrew was playing. So I went to rail. And then on his break, I basically introduced myself and we talked a little bit during his break, but not enough to really get into the details. Um, I basically, we probably just talked about like, you know, um, the TPE meetup on the break. And so like, you know, maybe I like wished him good luck and um, that I would, uh, you know, hopefully see him at the meetup. Uh, but but the, the actual first time we met is when he um, uh, went on break during that tournament I rail. I think, didn't I have you like give me a sandwich or a coffee or something? Like, I think you, you were poker caddying. <laughs> I probably was. <laughs> the, the, thing I, the, the thing I remember, this is how I knew I would like Andrew. Like, he, he called the waitress over and everybody was like ordering alcohol. Andrew ordered milk so he could dunk cookies in it. <laughs> <laughs> I was like, this guy's awesome. <laughs> you had to fight with him to get milk too. Like they are like, what you just want you just want a cup of milk? I was like, yeah, why well, is that complicated? Like, yeah. And it wasn't <laughs> the, the clue, like. it's like like who like at least like I mean almost no one orders milk. But the people who order milk do it to drink it. Nobody orders milk <laughs> for the sole purpose of dunking cookies in it. <laughs> I don't think I've ever seen anyone order milk at a poker table. That's a first. <laughs> yeah. I got, I got to say, and this isn't to brag to talk about a final table, but in Tahoe, the final, we were down to four handed and I ordered a pineapple juice and they all looked at each other. Like they all got a pineapple juice. Like, <laughs> they all realized how good pineapple juice was. You know, I feel like I contributed there. Like, yeah. <laughs> this is turning into a love fest for Carlos, but you know, he, he could be mauled by a mountain lion any second here. I say our kind words. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Andrew, do you got a favorite, uh, I think the first time I heard him on your podcast, I think the very first story I heard might still be my favorite, that for some reason he took three and a half hour of bus rides to get home, a mile and a half from the Rio. <laughs> and remember the, guy, remember the guy on the bus who was just staring you down? Yeah. My patience is wearing thin or something. What was the line? Yeah. So maybe Andrew doesn't remember this story, but this was like, I want to say... It wasn't the night that I won the 2K at the Binions. That that one, that one was like late at night. This was like during the day. So I was at Binions and I took the bus back to the crazy Brazilian lady's house. The crazy Brazilian <laughs> lady's house, yes. <laughs> and, but this is like midday. And uh, I'm sitting on the bus. I'm like happy, loving life, smiling, listening to my music. This was back when I would wear like the blue sharks. So I was probably looking mm-hmm. super douchey. Uh, <laughs> But but Thanks. there's this young black dude just sitting on the bus. He's like just just like staring at me like really intensely. And I'm thinking like, you know, what the fuck is this guy's problem? But he like says something to me and I couldn't really he would understand what he was saying because he said it kind of low. And um he he said something, he like kind of pointed out the window and we had pulled up like right next to a McDonald's and I thought he said, my picture, my picture. So I'm looking at the McDonald's. I was like, your, your picture's in the McDonald's? I was like, I don't, I don't get it. Like, I, I was like, I don't know what's going on. And he like did his like, his like come hither finger, like, like come here closer so I can tell you what I'm saying. And I leaned in and he says, my patience is wearing thin. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm thinking like, and this is like my first day. In, I, I can remember now. I can remember it was like my first day in Vegas. And I was like, man. So I like went to my seat and I just sat down 
and this dude was just staring daggers through me. He was just staring super hard. <laughs> and he like he was sitting like in the seat right next to the um, wall of the bus. And he took his fists and like punched like the right. the wall of the bus like super hard. And he's just like staring at me with like like a death stare. And, <laughs> and my first thought was like, Comforting. yeah, I was like. <laughs> Man, I don't want to go to jail for choking this dude out. Like, like I hope, <laughs> I hope this dude doesn't come towards me, man. Because, like, I was sitting on the other side. Uh, he was sitting in his spot, and, and I'm thinking, like, I guess maybe I was. I'm guessing maybe I was annoying him because I was like, you know, smiling and like bobbing my head to my music and just like enjoying life. And um, I was fine. Uh, I didn't feel threatened to anything, even though I assumed that's what he was trying to do. But I definitely like kept my distance, and and I was thinking if he if he charges me, I'm gonna have to choke him out. And it's gonna be hard to explain that, you know. Like I, they're gonna find some way to put me in jail, and that sucks. On my first <laughs> my first day, and and, and um, I guess like the bus, no, nobody else said anything on the bus, but I guess the bus driver kind of noticed it. And so when we got to the next stop, which was like right in front of the Bellagio, he um, he got off the bus and started running and the police were waiting for him and they like ran and tackled him. So I guess he's like a known <laughs> crazy guy. Crazy guy. Yeah. Yeah. So, the, yeah, that was like my welcome to Vegas right. trip. Yeah. <laughs> You're gonna have I forgot to you were taking out. the you, bus. You didn't have a uh, a can of red beans in your pocket. You could have smashed him with. It was going to be your fist, I guess. I was going to choke him, man. I didn't want to hurt him. I mean, I, I I basically just like. I mean, he was a small dude, so like. Um, <laughs> um, I I mean, I was. I just wanted to make sure that he couldn't hurt me, but like, I wasn't yeah. mad enough to like punch him. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm glad you made it out okay. Me too. Me too. There's been yeah. <laughs> several bus experiences that I almost did not make out of in Vegas. Yeah, I forgot you were taking the bus at that point, but you had a car, right? Why did you take the bus? I don't remember. I didn't have a car that year. Oh, you didn't have a car that year. Okay. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <laughs> I figured maybe he did the math and it cost him more gas or something. So he's like, oh. <laughs> Spend an extra hour and a half on the bus here and save myself. <laughs> uh, oh, Steve Fireman, I'm picturing you at a house. Is like, just curious. You don't want to burn, right? <laughs> <laughs> I have, I have another option for you. <laughs> um, to go back to the pandemic here, I got a few more questions here. Not to be, uh, I mean, Carlos, um, have you had to express to your family at all, specifically your mother, um, the seriousness of this? I mean, like, mom, don't let you, don't let my brother in, or you know, <laughs> shut yourself off. Has there been any things like that? Or well, I was telling her to not let him in way before the pandemic, but <laughs> I haven't had to express it so much to her because she works in a nursing home. Oh, that's home. right. And so, and so they, they are, you know, expressing it to her. Now I did have to explain it to my niece who I think is like 21, 22 now. And also a, a Gen Xer, she's a Gen Xer and, and also mm -hmm. my grandmother. Um, so those are the two I had to kind of explain it to. And it really became real to me when I was uh, talking to my niece about it because like, she knew it was bad, um, but she was kind of like um, closer to the idea that it's kind of like the flu. And I was like, so she knew it was worse than flu, but she knew it was worse than the flu, but she didn't know why it was worse than the flu. So I had to like lay out, you know, the doubling rate and just like the projections over the next couple of years. And, and the whole idea that, younger people like her can have it and not know it and pass it to somebody. And that was something that she didn't realize. So I think I did a good job of explaining it to her. Um, with my grandmother, um, she watches the news all day like I do. So I think she pretty much understood a lot of it, but I don't think she is as, like if I were her, 
or if I had control over her life, she wouldn't have any mm-hmm. visitors. Um, I don't think she understands how bad of an idea it is for people to come visit her who have not been self-isolating. So I try to explain that to her. Um, who knows if it sink, um, sink in. And my niece is actually still having to go to work. So she, I think I, I did a good enough job of scaring her that now she's upset that she has to go to work where before she was probably like happy that she could still work. But my only thing, like she works in a, um, a Home Depot like distribution center. So I guess they, okay. they still need someone to like do, like this is the time where people are going to be shopping online. So they, maybe they can, sh- they can close like the regular Home Depot stores, but they, they still need people to handle online orders. So I'm assuming that's why she's still working. But, um, uh, yeah, that's about the extent that I've um, talked to family members about it. How about you, Andrew? Do you have a grandparent still mm-hmm. alive? Or um, No, I haven't had to do a lot of heavy lifting family-wise. Um, I've tried a little bit on, um, I mean, I, I really don't like, for, despite my background in, in debate, I really don't uh, like arguing with people on social media and mostly don't find it very like sure. effective. So I haven't really tried to like... <laughs> argue argue with people but i have tried I, I've, I've noticed um carlos doing a bit of this as well we, we've talked about it um to at least like make make sure people know what i'm doing and why to like at least be an example and contribute. like i think i mean now i think for a lot of people at least I, and i mean i'm still in a bubble so it's probably not as true everywhere but um if you were to go back like two or three weeks i think it was on people's radar that there were some people like concerned about this but it was not like widespread the concern was not widespread the way it is now and um i think a lot of people who maybe even like understood academically that they maybe should be taking some precautions just like felt silly doing it right because no one not a lot of other they didn't really know people who were doing it or like that's how most people make their decisions it's called social proof right they look to other people around them and like oh what's everybody else doing okay i'll do that too um especially when it's like something complicated that you don't really feel like you have all the information or you're not really an expert in it it's understandable that you're just going to look and see what everyone else is is doing so i wanted to be at least doing my part to like shift the social proof the right way to say like well this is what i'm doing i'm doing this here's why i'm doing it making sure that people at least like saw the that they were aware of the argument i wasn't necessarily trying to like sell them on it if they were arguing back with me i was mostly like ignoring people who were saying oh it's just the flu you know like i I wasn't trying to get into an argument about it but i did want to put it out there that like and you know, presumably people who are following me on Twitter like think that I like things that I say are, are like worthwhile sometimes. Um, so, you know, hopefully I can capitalize on like whatever credibility I have with those people to um, to get them to take it a little bit more seriously than they might otherwise have. That was, that was yeah, I was strategy. telling Steve, uh, my mom has gone through breast cancer. She's got major like pulmonary issues. She's basically, if she catches it, she's, she's, she's going to die. So she's, you know, it's terrifying, but she's doing everything possible. She's totally shut off. She won't even let family visit, you know, doesn't want anyone yeah. stepping off an airplane to get, but, um, I can't imagine right now. I think there was some, maybe it was on Twitter or Facebook, some nurse who's like ahead of a, you know, an assisted living place says, you know, we have a hundred people here over the age of 80. We have three ventilators. So like the people who are there, um, not only worried about catching the disease, they know that there's probably just not going to be a medical response. So it's gotta be obviously, well, we know this is serious business. Not that I need to, uh, yeah, like like with my mom, she works in a place like that. And when she was telling me like the new rules they have in set for the have in place for the workers, that place is like four knocks right now. Because for the exact reason that you said, like if it gets in there, it will wipe the place out. That's pretty much what happened in Washington. Um, Seattle, I guess. Um, some somewhere in Washington, King County. Um, but um, yeah, they ha- they have to be the most vigilant at this time um, because, like you said, um, that's the exact wrong population we want to get hit by this thing. Right. And yeah. I mean, that issue is not even super. I mean, it's, it's certainly like a higher risk for older people, but I think a lot of the younger people who are thinking like, oh, if I get it, I'll just be fine. Or like you people who just look at the mortality rate. Um, 
the mortality rate is pretty heavily influenced by access to like a ventilator and to ICU. And um, there are a fair number of younger people who seem to be getting it and like not having symptoms that are so bad that they require hospitalization, including some people who are getting it, like not even knowing that they, that they have it. But um, you know, like there are younger people who are dying from this without, and, I mean, there was some speculation as to what might be the reasons for it, but like, there's not a clear identifier of like, here are the reasons why these younger people are dying and these other ones aren't. And um, I think a lot of people are underestimating like how bad the situation is likely to be in like next week or maybe even later this week. And like as, as the hospitals, like we're, what we're going to be seeing is people who got sick a week ago are going to start manifesting symptoms this coming week. And um, because of the exponential growth, like that, this is when the hospitals are going to get hit the, the hardest. I mean, assuming the social distancing strategy has worked, this is sort of the time when we're expecting hospitals to get hit the hardest because it's before everything really went on lockdown. And hopefully the lockdown has decreased the, the rate of spread to some degree. Um, but so like getting sick now, it's, if you can even get into a hospital, it's going to be an absolutely miserable experience. It's not that being in the hospital is ever fun, but you know, like you're not going to be getting good care. They might not even have a room for you. They're not going to have ventilators for you. You're going to be surrounded by people who are like miserable and die. Even if you survive the experience, it's going to be a really, really unpleasant experience. And I think a lot of younger people who are just saying, or is kind of assuming that they're like immune from it just because they're not going to die from it. Um, it may not be true that you're not going to die from it, but you can certainly experience a lot of like very, very negative um, effects. Right. Yeah. Like it's that. not going to be a walk in the park is what yeah. you're saying. Right. <laughs> it's like, be horrible. like when they can when they're categorizing these cases, I think they, they call like, they call them like mild cases and, mm. and serial case, uh, serious cases. I think the serious cases are the ones that are going to kill you or that I could kill you. And I think my, that's critical. And, I think there's mild crit serious and critical. Critical. So like, I think mild is like, Oh, you're just going to have like pneumonia or something. And I'm thinking like, that's not mild. Like what, what, like when I think of mild, right. It's like maybe a head cold, but what these yeah. people are calling my, and I think that's what a lot of these younger, younger people are thinking is that if they just, just get a mild case of it that's like having a cold like a mild case of this is still pretty damn bad yeah a couple uh 23 year olds dying because they can't because they're last in line at the hospital uh yeah that might change the overall perspective of you know the millennials like you said the younger people but i don't know i mean or we run into a situation where it's like well so if, if we do have a bunch of 23 year olds who get sick do we take an 80 year old off of a ventilator in order to give it to a 23 year old? Who's gonna die with like, I think those are like the, the kinds of, uh, the kinds of choices that our hospitals are going to be facing very soon. If they're in, not already. in the air, in the era of fake news, I honestly don't believe I, I really have trouble knowing what's true or not, but because I can't remember where I read half the stuff, but in Italy, supposedly they just took everyone who was over the age of 60 off ventilators. And see that, um, that at some point they, they had such a shortage. They were trying to, yeah, take it to the people who are kind of borderline who could survive, I guess. I don't know if that's... See, this is the thing that pisses me off about this. It's like the people who are taking it the least serious in that type of situation, their life is going to be valued more than somebody that was that was taking it serious that just happens to be older or sickly anyway. Like that, hmm. that, that is like the most tragic part of this. And, I, and, and you know, this is where I get pretty... Um, um, draconian, I guess is the right. word, but I feel like the doctor should be able to have some kind, and I know <laughs> this is impossible, but I wish there was a way they could like decide whether they're going to help you or not based on how serious you took this. Mm -hmm. But like, if, like, if I find out you went to spring break, oh, well, <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> and, and, and you went to spring break you brought the shit back home to your grandmother who was trying to self isolate, and but because she happens to be eighty, she doesn't get the ventilator. Oh fuck you! Yeah, yeah, yeah. That's a good point. <laughs> Is there anything? I, I mean, I should probably know the answer to this. <clears throat> the one thing I have been doing, I know Steve. We mock you. You can't even walk across an Applebee's bar without pissing twice because you drink fourteen <laughs> glasses of water a day. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, but that's probably a good idea to start. Lots of fluids. I wonder. Just talking. Can you? Is that even a thing where you? I should go to my doctor and it just occurred to me and preemptively ask for a prescription for penicillin maybe 
and just say, I'm going to take it as soon as I cough or feel uh, all muculent. Is that, I don't know I if that's that something will help. I don't know if that will help. I don't know. Would penicillin even work on this? I, I have no idea. I don't think, I don't think it will help. Um, no, I, I, I think we'd be hearing about that if that were uh, a thing. I, I have eight weeks of medical training from 20 years ago, and I have no idea. <laughs> yeah, I was thinking about Steve. I think Steve first started hearing about this thing, like maybe a couple of days after he was just uh, uh, sick while running in a crowded marathon. <laughs> yes. <laughs> I, remember, I, I was listening to the episode where you were talking about being sick during the marathon. I was like, oh, I think you said, oh, there's... 20,000 people, they were trying to squit, fit through a space that's made for 20 people. I was like, oh, this is just pandemic purgatory, right? Oh, now. yeah, yeah. It was, <laughs> it was the perfect avenue to spread this thing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. It, was, uh, it had just hit the news, and then we had the marathon. Yeah, <laughs> was, uh, so there was probably well, some people who may have had it during that marathon. Yeah, no, I would say that's probably likely, yeah. Because it's pretty yeah, bad in your area, people. right? Uh, it's starting to be, yeah. We had our first few cases uh, maybe a week ago, and uh, I haven't been to work in a few days. I'm sure I'll find out tomorrow when I go in. Um, but um, yeah, cases are starting to spike all over the county. Um, well, so. the, the Gavin Newsom, I don't know, let's just assume he's right, said 60% of Californians will have this by May 1st. Jeez. That's nuts. I don't, that's know, if nuts. That's, I don't know if that's at all accurate. Even if it's like 25%, that's 10 million people. <laughs> yeah. 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 Stay inside, people. It's a trip. Stay inside. Like I used to hear those stories. I used to hear those statistics and say, like, how can we how can we um you know prevent this? And now like I've seen so much from human nature on both sides that I don't think it's gonna be prevented. Like, um, so that's why I said just save yourself, man. That's all you can do. Right. Yeah. And, yeah. and make sure that you're not a vector, which is, I mean, those two things happen to go hand in hand, which is uh, convenient. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I don't know. I'm probably can't really share that. I'm the only one who's in a total panic about money. Um, yeah. You're Andrew in a bad makes spot. A lot of most of his money behind a computer. Steve, you're safe. And Car I mean, Carlos, it, it sounds ridiculous, but are you finding new ways to save money? <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know if it's possible. I don't know. No, I'm actually spending more money than I otherwise would have because of this, but I have enough saved up and, and surprise. I mean, I guess it's not surprisingly, but at first I was a little bit worried about my uh, coaching clients, like, you know, with other people not being able to work and like, uh, but maybe I would get fewer coaching clients, but I'm actually getting more because more of these guys are starting to like play online. So, yeah. So even though I haven't been, cause my plan was to go up in April to substitute teach in Portland. But now that that's out, I was a little bit worried about, um, income coming in, but the, um, online, the coaching has been picking up for me. So that's good. Nice. I tried to play the uh, Bovada had that big series this last uh, weekend, and uh, I uh, tried to move some money over on Coinbase, you know, the Bitcoin. Mm -hmm. And uh, apparently, my Google two step uh, authenticator isn't working now that I got a new phone. Uh, so oh. I, I had $40 left in my uh, Bovada where I could play one tournament. <laughs> I, I got a funny. Um, my mother, uh, you know, I wasn't really asking her for money. I was just having a, you know, often a, I'm like, you know, the state of California, I'm talking, I'm like, geez, you know, like I can probably make it for like six weeks, then I'm going to be screwed. She's like, you never should have left the post office. I told you. <laughs> 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 so she's, you better not be asking me for money. I'm like, no, no, no. She's, you know, I oh, think I've already mentioned waiting. on the show. Yeah, I think I already pandemic. mentioned on the show. So it's, she uh, changed her will where, well, my sister's the executor and my brother and sister get, you know, whatever money they get. And I'll get a trust where I can like pull like, you know, $90 a day out for groceries <laughs> in an emergency or something. Pretty good. God, you know, I've, I've set the pretty, the bar pretty low with my behavior. So I can't really, um, but it, just quickly about the money, I'm trying to make a decision here, Steve. This is, I mean, this is maybe an interesting one. Mm -hmm. Should I pay rent? this month um mm. 
it feel not only the money and not knowing what keg, it's like, I think there's a chance. I mean, a bunch of people who live right next to me won't and probably will suffer no punishment to their credit score or to their, I mean, if these are the kind of measures that will be taken, which is probably likely. Um, I don't know. It feels, I mean, I actually do have enough to pay it. Um, and I like to be, you know, not follow the rules, so to speak, but it seems kind of stupid to pay rent. I don't know. I guess um, something I have my own, but uh, well, it's like, that's the one thing my mother agreed with. I was talking, I'm like, I don't know, maybe I should. She's like, just don't pay rent, save your money. Okay, okay, there's some, I, if I get the mother's stamp of approval, I guess it's okay. <laughs> You're not worried about getting kicked out of your house? Well, they can't, they've already suspended evictions. Well, an ev eviction oh. process is like six months anyway. Um, okay, so yeah, I don't, I, I, I figured Steve would get angry about this. <laughs> you, you own a home and someone rents from you in Vegas, right? Uh, yeah. I can picture yeah. Steve's jaw getting all tight. <laughs> <laughs> Why don't you just pay the rent and get a second and third job when it's over? <laughs> yeah, I, I mean, uh, I don't know. I, I would pay the rent. I look at those as like necessary uh, uh, expenses, I suppose, right up there with food, water. But um <laughs> Do what you will. Well, if I, if I don't pay my rent, Steve, I don't keel over and die, is my point. Okay. You know. yeah. yeah. I suppose if you don't eat, that would happen. Okay. Maybe food is a little bit higher than that, but it, it's in the top three. I think. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> food, water, shelter. Okay. Number three. <laughs> oh, what I'm looking for, Carlos and I are always showing each other. If you just, you can almost Google anything with the, it ends with the word fight on YouTube and you get like 10 things you could say, like you say <laughs> Rom Romanian midget knife fight. And then all of a sudden you have like six choices. You know, which one? Are the <laughs> so I put in surgical mask brawl and I didn't get anything yet, but we're going to see those pretty soon. Right. Oh uh, yeah, I'm, I'm surprised you didn't find anything. That's, that sounds like both um, extremely likely to happen and also like above average likely to be videotaped. Yeah. <laughs> They're common. Well, this was a couple of days ago. There's probably a bunch of them up there now. I don't know. Videotape. When was the last time tape was involved in this? Oh, well, okay. <laughs> Films, yes. Oh, shit. That's funny. <laughs> That's so cool. um, I don't know if again, just because I've been talking like pop, my, my one buddy, I thought have like the best idea for this middle ground. Like we have to get back to work. We can't let everyone get unemployed, um, but we can't be like crazy with it. Why not? Um, the government hi hires a bunch of people just to go out there, even if it's unnecessary, rather than just arguing on how much check give, give them 20 bucks an hour, give them a hazmat suit and give them a scrub brush and say, hey, we're cleaning up the, the park. <laughs> I mean, is this, I don't know. This is, this is what I'm trying to think of. It's just, we got to like get people right, out there. The, the going out there part is the part we don't want. Right, right. Okay. No, I, mean, I, 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 I was going to say, I've, I've heard some um, thoughts of maybe starting to like let people go back to work if they've already had it. Um, under the impression that they've built up some type of immunity to it. Um, that could be one solution to like slowly trickle the work workforce back out there. Um, I don't know how, uh, how viable that is, but that's something I've heard being tossed around. I guess there's really, it's not like you can compromise with a hurricane and say, can you just, can you just skip San Diego, please? You know, it's, it's, it is what it is. The pandemic is. Yeah, it's called that's a pandemic was, for a reason. That's how the I knew it was very serious. <laughs> that's how I knew it was very serious. Yeah. There's, there was very little poker analogies with Carlos tweeting about the pandemic. <laughs> <laughs> Usually yeah. it's like, you know, uh, 100 people died. Runner, runner. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I haven't gotten to that point yet, but I'm getting close. I, I, I told a friend that I was getting to the point where I'm starting, like, either we're going to get through this or we're not, and I've gotten to the point where I'm kind of indifferent. <laughs> like, I almost don't care what happens anymore. Like, I, 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 Because I can't control it, I'm just making myself, like, an emotional wreck trying to um, – control something that's uncontrollable. So I think like this is the one area of my life where I am balanced. 
Like, you know, just I, I've achieved indifference, which I think uh, <laughs> is the goal if you want a uh, poker analogy. Right. Stoicism and your strength. All I needed to know when we were in the room, the ones playing the uh, bracelet event online, and yours just shut down. You just shrugged your shoulders. <laughs> <laughs> you went, you went, over, went over and opened a bag of chips and just started typing away at your computer. I'm like, shouldn't you be like throwing something right now? <laughs> <laughs> Why is your mouse still working and not broken against the wall? <laughs> yeah, that you can do about it, man. That you can do about it. <laughs> It also, I don't know, Carlos and Ranger, if you have any, it just feels like it's hard to even predict not only specific of the pandemic, but how this affects the country moving forward. Yeah. Uh, like, I think, just talking to my one buddy, I think this is, it's just going to change, the radical changes has just got no idea. I think, well, we're just talking about, you know, the five U.S. senators who are making these basically illegal trades. Really, really horrible. I'm sure you guys heard about it. You know, they, they're getting- yes. They're getting a lecture or, or in, the information that this could be worse than possible. And they're literally like going out the door and making stock trades and then getting on Twitter and telling everyone not to worry. Um, yeah. Oh, I didn't hear that part. So I don't know if it's I got the one hem, semi-socialist buddy. He's like, we're just going to realize that we, there's got to be more to public policy than making the stock market and rich people happy. I don't know. Is that, I don't know if that's, that's an exaggeration of our, but you know, the 1.5 trillion stimulus package was the first bit of worry is like, my God, we got to get the money in the stock market to at least shore up a few of these industries like the airline and the, the cruise industries and stuff. I, I don't know if you have any thoughts, but it's, there's going to be, even when this is over, the country's going to be radically different in a year, in my opinion. Yeah. yeah and as you said, I mean, it, it's, it's so hard to predict what those changes are actually going to be. And, and that's more where my indifference is, is coming from. Like, I wouldn't say that I'm indifferent to the continued survival of the human race. Um, <laughs> but I, I don't think we're, we're really facing so. existential. <laughs> <laughs> I, I don't think we're really facing an existential threat on that degree. I do think it's like, even a lot of things are going to seem bad in the, in the short term. Um, and honestly, I kind of feel this way about the, the Trump presidency also, um, that like it's it's so hard to know what the long term consequences of those things are going to be that like, you know, look, like, it's obviously going to be like very bad to live through, um, especially if like the, the more, some of the more like worst case scenarios that could come out of this are going to be like, it's going to be very bad that you were the one who had to live through that thing. But um you know, like what the world ends up looking like, it, it, certainly, you know, hundred years from now or, or 200 years from now, um, there's a lot of changes that probably need to happen in our society that we're just not capable of making voluntarily. Like anything that involves people um, needing to give up like true power or money or like, this is not anything that ever happened voluntarily. Like, those things only happen as a result of some kind of catastrophe. I mean, sometimes it's like a violent revolution sometimes it's a natural disaster or whatever but um like we're just not capable of looking and saying like, oh it would be better if our society were structured this way let's just all agree to do that like that's just not the way that stuff works so whatever the fallout of this ends up being um I just, even a lot of things that are like objectively bad in the short term we still have no idea what that'll end up meaning for the long term and like whether the world might not end up being a better place like 300 years from now as a result yeah, 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 I mean, a lot of people, um, yeah, I think if, if like the supply chains, this is something people talk about. I, I think without it being explicit, it's like, how does this not turn into a violent mess with people getting murdered as much as the disease? Like if, if <laughs> yeah. right now we have a show, people have to wait for toilet paper. They might have to wait for, like if there was a major disruption in, in the water supply and the supply mm -hmm. chains, I can't even imagine what it would be like in Los Angeles, for example. Yeah, <clears throat> I don't know if you yeah. saw this, Stephen Redding. See, this is the kind of thing I'm sure Carlos will agree with. That people being stupid is as much a problem as anything. Did you see in Redding, California? I, I tweeted about this. Um, they almost they averted a total disaster of their sewage system overflowing and ruining the water supply and stuff because they discovered people were wiping themselves with T-shirts shreds, tearing it up, and then flushing it down the toilet. Wow. So... <sighs> That's yeah. the other kind of shit I'm worried about. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah. When people aren't provided solutions, the things they come up with on their own usually makes things worse. 
I'm, yeah. I'm thinking about all the people like the um the um Indian Americans and and um people with cultures that um have other ways of cleaning themselves besides toilet paper, they're probably just like, you know, loving life loving life right now. <laughs> like it's not a bidet. I've heard this word before, I'm not gonna remember it, but um I've heard of something similar to a bidet um, that's uh, prevalent in Indian culture that that they use that you know they told Heart us notes. <laughs> the, the little the little uh, 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 Asian sprayer is that what you're talking about? I don't know. I think it's like a like a pot or something like a neti pot, like a hose. <laughs> no, not a po- not a hose, but like I don't know, man. I saw it on. Um, I can't remember the name of the show, but the host is, um, I can't remember his name either. <laughs> Last name is Minaj. Steve, um, next week Mickey we'll Miller. have an expert on, you know, feculent cleansing in Mumbai. <laughs> <laughs> <But> right now, <laughs> you know, we, Carlos gives us so much wisdom. You can't him to know the I'm exact, exact show, mechanics. <laughs> 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 There's a little bidet sprayer that they have all throughout Asia that is quite wonderful, and uh, I've actually that, brought it back to the states. It's uh, it's, it's a, this little uh, hose sprayer on the side of the um, on the side of the toilet. It's quite nice if anyone's on the fence about getting it. Uh, Forty bucks on Amazon. Yeah, get it's a great it bef- Christmas gift. Get it before those sell out. You have to fist fight for those too. Yeah, no <laughs> kidding. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. Yeah, as much as we'll talk about poverty and depression, I mean, very few people here have to deal with real scarcity. You know, I don't think yeah. we've ever really faced that for at least anyone who was born here. So it, I don't know if that'll be an issue moving forward, but. It's called a lo- yeah, it's called a LOTA, by the way. LOTA. A LOTA? L-O-T-A. Hmm. Looks like, okay. looks like a neti pot. Okay. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> Not sure if I totally want to know how the mechanics of that work. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> and, and the guy, oh, and man. the guy's name is Hasim Minaj. And, Hasim Minaj, okay. Yeah. <laughs> it's a pretty good show. I think I had, um, I think I had Mike watch it at his place one time. I can't, I can't believe I can't remember the name of this show. Have you heard of Andrew? <laughs> Now that the host name sounds vaguely familiar, but I definitely couldn't tell you what the show is that he has. He's the way I described it is is similar to uh, is I, I described it as a mixture between the Chappelle Show and the Daily Show when John Stewart hosted it, and it's huh. hosted by um, this Indian guy. Oh yeah, I've um, seen it. I, I forget his name, yeah, or I mean, I forget the name of the show. But um, right, it's pretty funny, and it's 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 a Great combination of funny, and it makes you think, and it's informative. Yeah, he's and very so, civic-minded. Yeah. Yes, yes, and I think Andrew would really like this show. I'm going to send a link to you. Yeah, you, you piqued my interest. <laughs> <laughs> now, online poker. Um, I don't think I'm not. Don't plan on putting any money on it. I, Carlos can probably good of. Uh, I mean, the last time you're here, I'm pretty much have become disinterested in becoming good at poker I'm, i've become good at spending long hours with discipline at a poker table and sensing where the the money's at but i don't think is online poker going to be there let's just say the the traffic doubles does it make it twice as easy or is that not really i don't know if it works in that way but i do know there is a there seems to be a little bit of an online poker boom happening right now um but I don't know if it, I think it makes the, uh, probably more profitable, but not necessarily easier. Cause you still have to get through like massive fields. In fact, the fields are even bigger now, but right. yeah, first, pra- first place prizes are ballooning all over the place. <laughs> okay. Have you have any, or any of your poker students? Like I need a big score, man. Like there's a, greater urgency when they speak to you there it's not just about learning the game getting fun it's like this is this is needs to be my money maker now no and if they ever did i would probably um cut them off because um the last thing i want to do is take somebody's money for a lesson when they're 
trying to depend on some variance riddle game to like pay the bills. Right. <laughs> so yeah, if any of you guys are listening to this, yeah, if you tell me that, you're done. <laughs> <laughs> so keep that one to yourself. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, yeah I, that, I, I try to filter out people like that early in the uh, in the process. Sure, sure, makes sense. I mean, just personally speaking, I feel it's not just about getting online. Like I would need to massively change my habits here and study a lot and things that of course I've never been real good at. <laughs> never actually do. Well, I, I assume my mother would take care of me, but now I have to, <laughs> I need a backup plan. You, you'll be she fine. Shot that you one will down. be fine on $90 a day. <laughs> oh, I don't know. We'll see. <laughs> He'll spend a hundred before breakfast. <laughs> yeah, that's true. I forgot who I was talking to. <laughs> By the way, that 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 guy is Hassan Minaj, and the show is called Patriot Act. Patriot Act, okay, yeah. Uh, yes, Act. Uh, yeah, okay. I have heard of that. Pretty good. Patriot Act. I'm gonna watch that. Yeah, that sounds interesting. Right on. Um, well, um, I have a quick hand. Oh. Uh, if. Uh, <laughs> I know Mike is just appalled right now that I haven't even mentioned that. Uh, if you you mind if I spice up one. the hands a little bit? <laughs> okay. All Some right. guy was choking me trying to pull the surgical mask out of my hand, and I decided, <laughs> do I want to bet, merge bet on the, with the queens with the ace high board? Or, you know. <laughs> right on. This one, uh, well, let me get, take a, a quick second and thank our sponsor, Tournament Poker Edge. Uh, Andrew Brokus has over 300 uh, videos on Tournament Poker Edge, hand reading, getting paid. Those are my two favorite ones. Uh, bluffing, range construction. Um, you guys both did a, a series a few years ago on Carlos's win of the uh, Bovada 100K. I like that one a lot. Yeah, that's fun. Um, that was like 17 yeah. years ago, wasn't it? Uh, 18. Uh -oh. But um, <laughs> what else are you going to do than study for uh, poker? Join Tournament Poker Edge. Uh, Get the discount code HUP month, HUP quarter, HUP year, depending on how long you sign up for. You'll score yourself 20% off. TournamentPokerEdge.com. Uh, okay. Oh, this Steve, one quickly, was on I have another yes. interesting thing here. I don't know. This is wildly irresponsible. I had, like I told you, six weeks is about, in my mind, how long I can go without making money. I just had my own custom ch chip set that I ordered. <laughs> of course. Carlos is already laughing at this. With your lava lamp? Caricature. <laughs> I, well, okay. Guess what? You're not invited to my home game. <laughs> I want to hear this. Keep going. <laughs> no, I was just, uh, the funny thing is I have two people who will host the game. I have a dealer who's desperate for money. And, okay. and I have a buddy that just wants to hang out with poker players and drink and get high. So they're both, uh, okay. And uh, I guess there's not, this isn't really a decision, but um, I don't know. Would you have a game, but everybody's got to be under the age of 50 or something like that. I, you know, this is, I, I've kind of put it off for the moment, but it's like, I know in a month I'm going to have to um, consider this. So I you hire know. someone to stand at the door with a uh, temporal scanner to take everyone's temperature no As they come COVID. in to make sure no one has a fever. Right. That's that's what we've come to. Okay. Yeah. That's that's not a bad idea. Yeah. That's what they're doing. That that's uh I saw that that's what they have to do. Um anytime they do these press conferences with the president, like every time the uh reporters come in, they get their temperature taken. <laughs> We're doing that at work. When I go to work tomorrow, I'm going to be issued a personal uh, thermometer and uh, uh, hopefully the oral type. And uh, if our Steve, temperature is over 100, then we got to go home. <laughs> <laughs> I beat you to it. <laughs> Custom chip set. <laughs> That's great. Does it have your picture on it? Say like Mikey's Mikey's Tavern or something. Of course, or it's got something like. Of course, it says Rampage Poker Club on it, man. You know who I am. <laughs> well, you don't want just generic chips here. People slide oh, it in there. No, of course it. not. Uh, <laughs> how much? Were, how much were the chips? Uh, I've, I got a thousand chips. I got a big one just in case, you know. It, it, <laughs> okay. So it's uh, of course. I, I I can't. It's like 180 bucks. I mean, it wasn't wasn't super cheap because it's. Um, Mom, cut him down to 75 bucks a day. Now. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> two days worth of trust fund <laughs> for the chips. <laughs> well, I was going to get a couple, uh, you know, rampage poker lounge chairs for people to hang out at the party, but I'm, you know, I'm cutting back a little bit. <laughs> he decided for the bead bag variety instead. <laughs> so would it take Andrew, let's just say over your many years of poker, you've seen some, uh, if you, someone put together a list, showed you a player list that had the eight biggest whales you've ever played against. Would you go play in that game? <laughs> I guess that's a no. <laughs> uh, no, no, no. That's a like legitimate question. Yeah, you're 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 making me uh, question my principles, which is good. Um, <laughs> the gears are turning here. <laughs> it's debating it. <laughs> yeah, there's a pretty decent chance I would, especially if they had the right. Um, I mean, it's like I. So I feel like there, there's two risks. Um, there's the risk to like my personal health and then there's the risk of me like becoming a vector towards uh sure hurting other people so i think like i think that the the first of those i'm allowed to gamble with the second i'm not really um so i think what i would need to do then is be in a much stricter lockdown than i'm on now and um so like there's a price where that would be worthwhile essentially where i would say like i think the the um if they're taking some precautions of having like a you know, thermometer at the door, that sort of thing. Um, and then I also think given my like age and health, the consequences of my contracting it will not be like, or not, they're not super likely to be cataclysmic. And, you know, I can wear a mask when I'm playing. Like I think if there's enough things that I can do to sort of decrease the risk to myself, and then there's also something I can do to basically nullify the risk to anyone other than myself. Um, yeah, there's a, a price where I would be comfortable for that. And the game you described would likely uh, clear that threshold. Right. You have to uh, sacrifice. He's got an eight whale cut off as, if there's six. You got to sacrifice the beard. You got you to sacrifice your beard to put on the mask, though. Oh, yeah, that's true. That's true. I, honestly, that wouldn't take as much as you think. <laughs> <laughs> About four really, minutes and a set of hair laziness. clippers and you're done. <laughs> the, the beard is held in place by laziness more so than anything else. Gotcha. <laughs> How about the uh, the events that the uh, your debate league? Is that like a, usually a monthly thing? Is there any like, hey, let's do this online um, through uh, a Zoom chat it, or something really, just so they can practice? Been, it has not been my debate league for 10 years. Oh, okay, um, okay. So I, I mean, I, I know that they've, they had to cancel the city championships, which is you know, about as big of a deal as it sounds. Um, <laughs> it is the kind of thing, I, I don't know if they've done any debates online. It's not the sort of thing where they could move the entire thing online because it would be, it's like hundreds of students would be competing. Okay. Um, so I, I think they're not going to have, uh, or I, I, I'm sure they don't have the capacity to accommodate like all of them and, and set up all of that. But uh, I do think it would be, I imagine it would be, feasible that they might be able to take a couple of the teams that are currently like the highest ranked in the in the league because they've had you know competitions earlier in the season um they might be able to do something like just take the you know eight highest teams and do like a bracket with them or something um that that, I mean, that that's the sort of thing i would be thinking about if it were still my league which it is not mike you can't bet on debate <laughs> <laughs> can't bet on that. <laughs> that's, that's not true Oh, I guess you can. <laughs> Is there, there? I guess there would have to be a decided winner, right? I've never been to a debate. There'd be some. Yeah. I would bet on some raging There's lunatic making like bad arguments and then saying it was fixed afterwards when he <laughs> when he loses. <laughs> in uh, if, for for a big round like that, there would be a panel of judges. A, a typical debate round, there would be a, a single judge, but it's always an odd number. So yeah, you come away with um with a winner. Not that it would ch change oh, okay. the debate league, but another one about those. You know, how are things going to change in the future? Um. Me and buddy were talking. I got a buddy. He, you know, he goes. To, he's he runs a company. He goes to like these conferences, sales conferences. So much of this is inessential. It's guys going around the, going around taking plane flights just to just to have dinner and to play golf. Like this is. I'm just just what. So much of the stuff we're doing online now is probably like all these colleges that are shutting down and they're giving the curriculum online. I mean, these kids are going to school for frat parties and lacrosse games as much as you know. I don't know. I guess I've, I've bored you enough, Steve. You can is, is there a question there? Or <laughs> <laughs> he just does this, Andrew. He just rambles, and then you got to try to interject at, at well, some point. I, I guess just I'm saying, um, conducting you know business online is uh, there's probably a lot of people who are uh, I don't know if you think that's that could be a long term loser of jobs too. I'm I'm focused on the economy here, so everything to me is like. I mean, I think that's something that could end up being good for the economy, also. Um, have a, like 
us being better set up to to operate online. I mean, one thing it's like it's unpleasant to think about, but there's no reason to think this is the last pandemic we're going to face. I mean, in fact, the, there's reason to think that global warming is likely to be unlocking more sure. uh, things that we don't have immunity to that have been like frozen for a long time that are now like when ice is melting, like those things might be coming out or just like otherwise climate change, I think, can um, can cause things like that to spawn. So, I mean, hopefully this is, among other things, a wake up call of like what we need to do so that we're not caught so unawares if something like this happens again. Um, and like having places better set up to sort of roll quickly into um, working online. I mean, I also think having people better set up to work online is good for for climate change generally, for cutting fossil fuel emissions. Or if you have fewer people commuting to work, like that's a pretty good way of, of reducing our emissions. And it's another one of those things that like, my not that I follow this closely, but I mean, my understanding of the data is that there's really not a, a um, a productivity drop off in in letting people work. For, I mean, obviously, it depends on the job, but like there are certainly jobs where there's not uh, there's not like a big a big productivity drop off in letting people work from home, and there's just sort of a general, um, I mean, probably just like a bias or whatever, or, or people just worrying that their employees aren't going to work that well, or, or there's just inertia towards uh, or against letting people work from home. So I do think it's possible that that's like one one bit of fallout from this is employers start to see like, oh, our company didn't fall apart when we shifted to working online, and it was a little bit of a shit show because we weren't really prepared to do it. But if we were prepared to do it, right. this is actually a pretty feasible thing. And like maybe going forward, we can have a lot more people working from home, and you know that might mean that we don't have to take as drastic measures to reduce our emissions. Um, going forwards. I mean, I think we're still going to need drastic measures, but like something like that, if it ends up being a relatively painless transition, like that would be nice. Yeah. I kind of, yeah. I was saying like even a month ago, I said like the worst case scenario, even if they shut down, this is like a good fire drill hunter for when the real shit comes and there's probably realer shit down the right. road at some point. Yeah. So sure you're fine. What is quickly the first symptom that we get here. Is that the fever or is that more like the chest congestion? I, I, I should know. I've, even that, I think I've heard different. This is another thing that's actually a positive that I've kind of heard recently and it's starting to become more like I've seen it in more places. But they say that for a large percentage of the people who test positive, one of the first symptoms they get is a loss of sense, uh, a lo loss of their sense of smell and taste. Hmm. Hmm. And so with that, that's actually something that is so that's unusual enough that if that becomes common knowledge, then, you know, these carriers who don't have like the bad symptoms, like if they notice that that happens to them, they can like quickly quarantine themselves where, you know, you're not so sick that you're, sneezing and coughing on people at that point so that can maybe help with it not being so um infectious if if you feel that you know for some reason you've lost your sense of um taste and smell it's time to go inside hmm. Hmm. I you know this is really in, in the opposite of saying like oh well if, if i can still smell things i'm probably fine um i think there's there's very little that we really know right now so like it, it, yes. It's fine to treat things as like reasons for caution. Um, it is not fine to treat the absence of a symptom like that as reason for um, optimism or abandon. Right. The best thing to do is just assume that you have it and that everyone else has it. Yeah. That's the safest way to, to deal with this. You know, you guys, especially with this thing being atomized and it stays in the air for hours, like I, I was thinking... I've I've been running the last few days uh, up in the mountains and stuff, and there's been surprisingly a lot of people on the trail. And my mindset, basically until just a little bit ago, was like, well, this is probably some of the best things that people can do is stay in shape. If you do get some fresh air, you know, uh, if 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 your body will be more resistant to this virus uh, just because it's healthier. But even that, being out on the trails, if if that's right, that it can stay atomized for hours, like Peloton. Yeah, <laughs> I guess so, right? <laughs> YouTube yoga videos is in my future. Is that what's yes. going on here? Steve, you're we the one person will be sure. We'll be sure. The universe has plans for you. You're going to be up there at age 106 in your single engine plane, flying around. <laughs> it's good to be young. You'll be yelling as you. <laughs>
Uh, right on. All right. Okay. This was uh, uh, this sorry, was my I'm, attempt. I'm actually going to need to cut out before the uh, before the hand. Okay. Uh, okay. You got to get going, Andrew. Yeah. Uh, okay. So let me just say thanks, guys. It's been fun talking to you. You too, Andrew. You and too, if uh, if guys want to get in touch with you from coaching, where can uh, where can they do that? Uh, there's more information about coaching at thinkingpoker.net slash coaching. Um, you can just reach me directly, Andrew at thinkingpoker.net, if you want to email me or uh, follow on Twitter. My DMs are open um, at Thinking Poker. So that's you know, just if you want to see whatever I'm up to or contact me specifically about coaching or whatever. Right on. Well, thank you for coming on the show, Andrew. You have thank a good you, rest man. of the day. Okay, man. Bye-bye. Carlos, okay. Carlos this... is, is going to come up with it. I can't, I can't smell anything. Click. <laughs> <laughs> that, that's my worst nightmare is not being able to taste food. Yeah. That yeah, would that be worse than that. <laughs> oh, right on. Um, okay, this one is a um, uh, Bovada, your favorite, uh, uh, Carlos. Yes. Um, it's, uh, this is the Crazy Eights uh, tournament. Uh, you know, it's one of those where you get... Uh, 80,000 chips or whatever, and, and the blinds go up every eight minutes or something. One of your favorites. Um, I hate that tournament. Yes. <laughs> <I know>. Yes. <laughs> no, you're quite familiar. Uh, okay. This one's pretty quick. Um, the button, it folds to the button. Are, um, I'm just going to talk in big blinds here. Um, the button okay. has 61 big blinds. We're in the small blind with 66 big blinds. And the big blind has 46 big blinds. Um, and the button does a min raise. He opens to two bigs. And we're in the small blind with ace eight offsuit. His numbers after 50 hands, uh, so he's got 61 big blinds. His numbers are 36. His V pip is 36. Pre flop raise is two. So out of 50 hands, He's raised one. Okay. I think we can call here. Okay. You're you're calling there. Are you are you calling in that Mike? Um no. I think it's a three better fold. And um I don't know. Like I, I'm in five five red chip grinder mode cash. And like there's spots like this where there's a guy who let's say he's opening 100% of buttons and here with any ace, of course you have a great range advantage. Um, I'm still folding most of the time, you know, there's better spots. That's usually my mindset, but um, yeah, the, the flat didn't occur to me, but. Okay. I was yeah. in the same mind. I thought it was either a three better fold. And uh, I don't know if this guy had, if he was like 36, 15 or something, then. I feel like what's the, uh, it's a, uh, what's the stats in the big blind? Is he? Uh, there's probably spots where I could f just flat the small blind because the big blind is so tight. That would be a, the only thing that would change here. You know, the big blinds numbers after 50 hands. He's a V pip 10 PFR zero. That would no three bet. That would be a stronger argument for why you can flat here too. I think. Okay. Okay. I, I thought this might be a fold. After, I ended up folding, so it was just a quick hand. But um, I thought it was a fold just because the button, out of 50 hands, it only opened one. This is the second time he's done it. Um, oh, yeah. And, well, yeah, the, the, it, main, the main difference I would say here is um, you're looking at his overall number, which is going to be much lower than his button open um, percentage. And also, you do have a blocker, so he's less likely to have a lot of the hands you're worried about. Like, is this guy really just going to, like, fold Queen Jack <laughs> around? Good point. But here's the thing, though. Like, so you say his VIP is pretty, is pretty high. Uh, so uh, I imagine this guy's doing a lot of limping. If he, so you got to be careful with the high VPIP because some people's VPIP is high because they call a lot when other people open. And then some people actually open a limp, open limp a lot. So if this is the type of guy that open limps, his range, his raising range is going to be stronger than normal. But if he's the type of guy, maybe there's somebody else at the table that's been opening a lot. 
And so he's just been calling them. And this is like one of his first chance getting to raise first in. Okay. So it's kind, of, it's kind of hard to know which of the two situations we're in. But in either case, their button opening range is going to be a lot wider than their overall um, PFR. Okay. Okay. And what's your reasoning there for calling instead of three betting? Because I think he probably is too tight to three bet with a hand this week. Um, so I actually just checked some of the, um, uh, information that I've gotten from my coach, um, Ryan LaPlante and just like, you know, GTO will flat here, um, off of, um, um, these stack sizes. Of course, that doesn't take into account how tight we think this guy is. Um, so I would say if you're not going to flat, it's much better to fold than three bet. Um, but I do think flatting is an option. Assuming that we have antis also. Yeah. Yeah. So, and, so and what stack size is flatting um, bad once you get down like 30 and under? I mean, is it, is it because it's 50 effective here? You think you can flat or what's? Actually, I think it may becomes, it is still... I think the more shallow you are, the more it becomes a flat in that you're able to just stack off um, with one pair a lot lighter. If say uh-huh. if you got, like say if you're 20 bigs effective, I think you can flat here with 20. I think I might be more likely to shove with 20. Yeah, I was thinking that. But yeah. I, I would shove with 20, I think. Maybe not yeah. with this guy's numbers, but an average open, I would just reship base eight here. Right, but but in general, you can actually flat wider the shorter you get because there's fewer reverse and plot odds. Right. Okay. So, what is your three betting range here? Is it pure? Is it purely linear? Linear and like nines plus? Or are you gonna try to balance with the ace five? Is it, balance isn't really a word you probably use in Bavada tournaments, right? I mean, no. I'm I'm probably going something like eights or nines plus mm-hmm. and suited Broadway hands. Okay. 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 Yeah, this All is right. just again for these spots. While this is Steve, I give my my myself some credit for uh, cobbling my ego down a little more every year. So it's like I know for sure. Um, Carlos has done all his work with Flopzilla and everything. Where he's going to know exactly which boards to check raise or you know lead and stuff. And I'm just going to be like, okay, let's double barrel. <laughs> <laughs> I can. If I, this I can, isn't a triple barrel bluff. I don't know what is. I can. I, I can. I, I can at least bet twice and only only risk. Uh, you know, forty percent of my stack or something stupid. So it's like if it, the less you know, the better it is. Just to, to play strong hands is, is my advice. Okay. Yeah, I don't. I don't think folding this is a massive mistake. I think three betting it might be pretty a big, pretty big mistake. But yeah, folding is probably fine. Okay, I thought the order would be fold, three bet, then call. But you're saying it's call, fold, three bet. Yes, I'm a little bit unsure about the last two. I almost okay. feel like I almost feel like call is definitely the first one. But based off how tight we think this guy is, it feels like three betting has to be a mistake. Okay. How okay. many are you calling with all aces there? I mean, like ace, ace, six off too. I mean, what is? This is like the bottom. They say off is the bottom. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay. I don't feel horrible then. Okay. Good deal. Well, pretty anticlimactic. I just fold and uh, <laughs> never find out what the guy had or anything. <laughs> but, uh, I remember at this uh, one, I you know, ninety eight percent of our decisions are just automatic. And when I saw this, I'm like, this feels very close. And uh, and I just remembered Alexander Fitzgerald and his his whole speech about offsuit aces, and I thought, oh, fuck it, there's got to be a better spot than this, and I let it go. Well, these are probably the more useful strategy discussions, Steve. Just take a spot we see all the time and discuss what your range is. For me, it's, yeah. for me and you, it's always like, oh, this guy who had nine toes, uh, you know, <laughs> coming up with every little goddamn weird thing that's happening at the table, and then, you know, <laughs> missing out on yeah. the big points, you know. <laughs> Well, let, let me ask you this, Carlos. How do you feel uh, if you're saying ace eight off is the bottom of your range? What what are you doing with ace five suited? Um, that one against this guy, I'll probably call that one too. 
So I'm, okay. I'm probably calling all the suited aces. As far as the offsuit ones, this is probably the bottom. This is the bottom, yeah. Okay. All right. What are your uh, okay. your study habits? Pretty much remain the same in these these times here. I mean, you uh, you, you going over like all your Bavada hand histories and watching just a shitload of videos and. Um, I don't watch as many videos as I used to. I always go all, over all the tournaments I play. Um, I've started mixing in. Um, well, I guess not mixing in. Um, Ryan and. Um, streamed over the last two days. So I, I watched Ryan's stream. That's basically a training video. It's like a seven hour training video hmm. uh, watching him play. Um, so I did that and I think he may do it again next Sunday. Um, but that and a lot of it is just coaching. So while I'm coaching and coming up with strategies for my um, students and fixing their leaks, that kind of helps me get better also. Do yeah. you have um, – what percentage of videos – this would have been a good question with Andrew here. Do you feel like I know all this? I mean, that must happen with greater frequency now where, like, five years ago, like, everything Assassin was, was saying would had you free or furiously work in your mind, yes, 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 and now I'm guessing that happens yeah. much less frequently, right? Yeah. Um, there's a lot of times where I'm seeing things that I know, and but for me, a lot of it is – uh, just because I know it doesn't mean I do it correctly while I'm playing. So for me, a lot of it is focusing and playing my A game when I'm actually at the table. But yeah, and there's very few things I see nowadays that are like, you know, like eye opening aha moments in training videos. Right. I mean, that's what I figured, you know. Yeah. So how yeah. do you keep maintain your uh, your love of the game? I would think you like learning. Um, there, there's less yeah. to learn now, right? Or I, I, maybe not. The game's always going to be changing. And for me, this has always been about money. Okay. So I mean, I enjoy the game, but uh, my primary motivation for playing is um, not having to go to work. So. Um, even if I'm not, in fact, my learning, this is something Andrew and I talked about on the um, uh, Thinking Poker podcast is that he thought that because of my love of learning, I would be more into like PO solver and things like that. But I'm actually not into those at all because they don't help me as much as, at least I don't think they would help me as, as much to beat the type of players I'm playing against as just studying my hand histories and like figuring out how, figuring out what mistakes the population makes. Yeah. So I, sp I spend most of my time on that. And um, you kind of get like, I, I learn new, I, I enjoy learning new things about the mistakes they make as opposed to fixing the mistakes I'm making relative to GTO. Right. Hmm. That's an interesting. Unless you make that. the final three tables of the main event. Uh, Never Ex plan that exploitive tournament. play will always will always pretty much trump the GTO stuff for most for ninety five percent of poker players, right? I don't know is that. Uh, yeah, even probably more so like high rollers as opposed to the main event because okay. like there's a, there's some uh, decidedly non GTO players who've made the final three in the main well, event. Well, that's true. Yeah, over the years, uh, but like if you ever wanted to play like the Aria super high roller hundred K and all that kind of stuff, then yeah. For sure, you need to know the the PL song, and I'm glad Andrew's not here because Andrew hates when I talk like this. <laughs> 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 but the uh, I think uh, as far as implementing GTO, uh, so let me be uh, clear here: as far as implementing GTO, you would be in that type of environment, like in a super high roller. Of course, there's some benefit to learning GTO, even to playing in exploitive games, but just learning how best to deviate from it. You, you never will want to try to apply GTO at the stakes I'm playing. <laughs> yeah. Sense. Yeah. Yeah. Does, 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 Andrew, does, does Andrew ever get on you about, I don't know, needing to be more ambitious with poker? Like, I'm guessing this is not, he, he understands, totally respects your philosophy, but it's like, geez, dude, with a little work, you could be like, 
a 510 crusher who makes more money in three weeks than he does in two years? No, I think I actually told him once that if he could teach me how to play 510, live 510, and um, make, I don't know, 50, 50 bucks an hour of that, I, I wouldn't want to do it. If I, if I had the ability to do that, I wouldn't want to do it because it's just not enjoyable to me. Like, I, I know I just said that, you know, the money is my primary motivation, but uh, enjoyment and, and, okay, let me let me correct this. So it's not necessarily money, it's freedom. So because I can make enough money doing what I'm doing in an enjoyable way that gives me the freedom from having to go with a bunch work, of assholes for 50 hours a week. Right. Like if I, if I could double my hourly to play live cash in an environment that I didn't enjoy, I would not do that. Yeah. Okay. And I think Andrew understands that. Um, but if you don't have another hand, Steve, I actually have one. Hmm. Oh, okay. <clears throat> Before I forget right, this thought so, regarding mm -hmm. Carlos's coaching, anyone's looking for poker coaching. You're fucking selfish. Send me five dollars on PayPal. I'm struggling. Okay, go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> Fuck this the guy. Rules. Tell him to drop his price no. to forty-five bucks an hour and send some love my way. No, sorry. Go ahead. <laughs> <laughs> shout out! Shout out to um, uh, Alexander Fitzgerald, Assassinato. He's definitely um, slowed up on doing private coaching himself. And so he's been referring some of his low stakes guys to me and that's been um, helping with um, keeping my um, volume up in terms of nice. coaching. So you got to get on the uh, little text group that uh, me, Mikey and uh, Alex are on. Yeah. I would Did you get that uh, little, uh, little love note from Mike, uh, to how to join and all that? No, Mike, I didn't get that. <laughs> <laughs> the Marco Polo. No, <laughs> it's fun. Yeah, we, that, get, that, we got no, nothing to do did, but he, sit he, inside he, all day. So. No, I did. I did send him a message, but maybe it was for the wrong number. We got a chat group. I think Clayton just joined too. So it's me, you, yeah, yeah, and yeah. Clayton. Uh, Carlos was supposed to be the. Uh... Yeah, that that sounds like fun. I'll definitely be down for that. Yeah. Okay. We'll send you another link. It's it's entertaining. <laughs> all right. Right on. So Bovada hand. Okay. All right, so this is a Bovada hand. This is actually the Sunday special, which I guess is their main event. Um, One I would have loved to play in if I could have gotten <laughs> quite base money over. Yeah. <laughs> I basically this... had to win that tournament that I was going to, that I was playing in order to be able to have the bankroll that I wanted to play this weekend. But I, I've definitely, I, I've been in situations where I was like a dollar short for a tournament <laughs> I wanted to play. And so I would just like load up the biggest cash game I can and then just like check shove the first hand with the two cards. <laughs> like, all I got to do is just steal the blinds one time and I can get into this tournament. Then I can enter the tournament. <laughs> yeah, I've definitely done that on more than one occasion. <laughs> uh, so this was 159,000 guarantee for some reason. Okay. Um, and we are at the 200, 400 level. Well, I'll just do like you did with the big. So okay. action folds around to the small blind and he has me covered, covered by, um, he basically has more than double my stack and I have 20, 26 bigs. Okay. And he opens from the small blind for like two and a half. And we have five, four of clubs. Okay. So, so I think this is kind of a uncontroversial defend. Yeah. All right. So I call, and the flop is Queen of Spades, Eight of Hearts, Seven of Spades, and there's twenty two sixty in the middle, which I guess is about five and a half bigs. Okay. And he bets just under forty percent pot. So not fifty. And so, uh, actually, he bets pretty much just over forty percent pot. So we have. So this is blind versus blind. We're in position, and we basically flopped 
a gutter? Um, what, do you have any numbers on him? Any stats? No, I don't. I do think he's probably pretty aggressive. Just And this is just an assumption based on the fact that he um, is the chip leader at the table. Mm-hmm. And and the fact that he's using some, I guess, non-standard bet sizings, <laughs> like to me, that's generally like a a decent, not necessarily a great player, but we know he's not just clicking buttons when he yeah. when he when he makes it like he actually made it like two point four five or something like that. Okay. Okay. There's some thought going into this instead of right. Uh, yeah. What, what? So there was twenty two sixty in the middle. What he bet like nine fifty. Nine fifty. Yeah. Okay. Uh, I. I mean, I, I think I just fold here. It, it, I, I, if we had to draw something like, <clears throat> um, maybe um, Jack ten. I would feel like it, it's possible that if we get a 10 or a jack, that could be good if he's if he's got something like an 8 or a 7. But here with the two cards lower than anything that's on the board, on top of that, it's a gut shot. Um, I mean, unless we're thinking of running a bluff here or something, uh, I'd probably just let this one go. What, what do you think, Mikey? I'll do whatever Carlos does. <laughs> that's, that's my way of saying I haven't really been paying attention, Steve. I'm sorry. I'm sending Carlos. A, uh, uh, I'm, se- I'm Marco sending him Polo a Marco invite. Polo link here. I apologize. I apologize. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I feel like Mike will probably be on board with what you're saying, and I think that's probably the best thing in this pos- in this exact situation. Um, but I'm not 100 percent sure. I would feel a lot better about continuing if that eight of hearts was an eight of clubs. Yeah. So, yeah, I think I'm on board that we probably can get away with just folding here, but I didn't. Okay. Um, I called. And basically what I'm thinking is uh, I'm making a mistake that a lot of people make, which is projecting. Like because of the sizing that I've seen from this guy and – um, who knows? Maybe he just had aggressive stats in game that I don't have in front of me now. But I know I do this a lot with a ridiculously wide range. And so I know when someone's raising that size preflop, I'm defending the big blind with close to any two cards. Having position, facing a small open from a likely aggressive player, I'm not folding anything. And so – even though this is like a bad gutter, it's probably high enough up in my range versus a small bet that if I fold this, I could be overfolding to a guy who may actually be over bluffing in this spot. Okay. So it's something to think about. So, so for example, so he bets 950 to win 30 to 10. So, he needs this bet to work basically 30% of the time to show profit with any two cars. And if I'm defending a hundred percent of hands, a, a gutter has to be like in the um, top 70% of hands I'm, I'm calling with preflop. So I decided to continue. And, and it also gives me another, um, I guess I'm not going to say that part until later because that's kind of a spoiler. So let's just say I call. Okay. And the turn is the eight of spades. So now the board is queen, eight, eight, seven with three spades. Okay. And villain? And villain bets uh, this time... He bets 2020, 20, which is uh, what percent of the pot is that? So uh, now he's betting just slightly less than 50. Yes, just under 50%. Pot. I'm sorry, quickly. I, uh, you have five, four clubs? Yes. Okay. On a queen 887 board. Okay. Yes. And a flush draw got there on the turn. Um, 
So there's three spades on the board, one heart, and I have five four clubs. Uh, well, I, I would have folded the flop. Uh, <laughs> I'd probably let it go here too. I mean, what you must just be ranging this guy as completely what? Um, I guess what I'm saying here is even if he's doing this with like a, a king king four offsuit or something, like we still can't win um, unless we right. somehow take this away. Um, yeah, I, I don't know. Are, are you thinking a, a raise here? Um, yes, yeah, a shame Mike wasn't paying attention to this one. It feels like <laughs> it, it feels like I'm getting excited here. No, if I call the flop, I can already tell you I have bluffing cards in the turn where I'm raising his bet. I don't know what the best ones are for that. This would seem to be a good one. Yeah, so I want to blame. I, I okay. want to blame. I want to blame you for this. Um. Because I think you were one of the people that kind of um, let me know how I was playing a little bit too straightforward on later streets where you like to get out of line. And to me, this seems like a great spot for it. Like if you put yourself in villain shoes, once I call the flop bet, what are you putting me on? Spade Good draws point. a lot. Uh, flush draw, straight draw. An eight. Or a pair. Queen, yeah. Yeah. So I think – this eight of spades coming on the turn here has to be pretty scary for the majority of his, obviously his bluffing range, but even like if he's sitting here with like pocket jacks or something, or even like, I guess he might force himself to call with like queen 10, but it can't be loving life. Like I'm shoving here. And yeah. so like, I really, really enjoy floating with straight draws on flush boards and then repping the flush when it comes in because because uh, people are so afraid of that flush card and i don't know i think this guy has a number of bluffs in his range and on top of that he has a number of one pair of hands in his range that has to not be happy facing a shove on this exact turn card where the flush gets there, and if I was calling flop with an eight, um, that gets there as well. Hmm. Yeah, I mean, I think so. I, I mean, maybe this is bad thinking. I would be almost in bluff, more likely to be in bluff mode um, if it was a middle position opener you were facing because he can't have any eights. Does that, does that uh, make sense? Or he shouldn't? Um yeah, I think he definitely has but, fewer but eights. The MP, of course, um, player would have would be able to check back here too. So I don't know how many check raise opportunities because this would be the the card to check back with with almost your full range if you were a, a C, C betting for middle position. But I mean, on, yeah, on just a fact, on a theoretical level, um, when the eight comes, you should have uh, you're more likely to have eights in your range, but. Right. Uh, I like your point that when the guy opens from the small blind as opposed to middle position, he's going to have more eights in his range, but he's also going to have more air. Right. True. So I don't, I don't know. I don't necessarily know how to balance those two things. I know had I been out of position in his hand, I would have just led into him on the turn. So he wouldn't have had a chance to double barrel anyway. Uh, but in this case, I didn't get the opp opportunity to do that. So I think if I'm going to continue in his hand, the only way to do it is by shoving. Um, I have um, 9K behind, and there's um, basically 4K in the middle, and he bets like 2K. So there's 6 in the middle, and I have 9 behind, which is um, like 22 big, something like that. Okay. So I went so for nine k behind, so that's seven thousand more for him to call. Plus yes, nine. I'm sorry. How much the two thousand he bet on the turn? How much was the pot when he bet that? Um, it's a little bit sixty. Yeah, yeah, a little bit, a little bit under half pot. I would be a little more likely to think that there's value there. Maybe that's. Um, yeah, if he bets like three quarters pot for some reason, maybe this is my own mental yeah. blank. I'm more thinking no. that he's trying to push you off a hand. Interesting. 
See, I'm more likely to fold if he bets bigger on the turn. But again, that could just be me projecting because if I'm bluffing in this spot, I'm always trying to give myself a good price because 2K is still a significant chunk of my stack where I can't just be uh, uh, double floating this guy willy-nilly. So I don't think if I'm him, I may do the opposite of what he did. Like I might go a little bit above half, but I'm not going to go like, three quarters or something like that on a bluff here. Well, he doesn't seem to be setting up the, I guess he can still set up. If you, if you just call there, there's, eight, yeah, I guess it's a, the pot the size, it's a pot nine. size shove in the river. So yeah, it's. Yeah. Yeah. That's true. Cause I, 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 I generally do that as a bluff also <laughs> where I'm setting up. So it's, it's so like predictable. I mean, not predictable, but um, exploitable. It's like, if I ever set up a pot size river jam on the turn, I'm always bluffing. <laughs> uh, so maybe this is what I thought this guy was doing. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, uh, it's a pretty okay. good card. Well, unless my math is off here, it's uh, he's got to call 7K after your 9K shove. Uh, he'd be 32%. Yeah, so he's, he's going to be little, good. Yeah, close to two to one here. Okay. So I shove and he calls which is not good for us. And he has ace eight offsuit with yeah. no spade. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So, so my, I'm wondering if there's enough hands in this range that this works against. And uh, I'll have to like do some um, flopzilla analysis to see if that's the case. And obviously we have to assume, I mean, make assumptions about what he's willing to fold. But I think this might be good against a lot of his one pair. Combos I, I think, and, yeah, I don't know how polarized his, his bet there is too, where he, if he never has queen X, then this is, I think always a good bet. If he's yeah, tiny, see that, that, yeah. That's a good point. Cause a lot of these people don't value bet thinly enough. So maybe he doesn't bet with something like queen 10, queen nine. And if he's only betting with his strong Queens, and like those are like the only one pair of hands he has. Obviously, he's still got like aces and kings in his range, also. But he's got a lot of ace highs, king highs, um, in his range as well. And like if I'm him, I'm gonna have shit like five four in my range. Um, mm -hmm. I'm, I'm gonna be raising five four um, from the um, from the small blind betting flop. And do I barrel this turn? Uh, now, that's a good question. I don't know how much if he's – this is only good if he's betting that turn with a lot of his um, his bluffs as well. Yeah, with his crap, with his – Yeah, uh, yeah. so that's the key, I think. Or whatever, yeah. so, so to Mike's point, I think if he's betting with the bluffs but not with the weaker top pairs – then I like this a lot. But if it's the opposite is true, where he's not betting with the bluffs and he's he is betting with the weaker top pairs, then I think this isn't good. Even even though I think this is the perfect card to do it on, um, if the guy's just not bluffing enough, it's not going to like there's nothing to get him off of if he's not bluffing off often enough. Um let's just say this is a guy you had like twenty thousand hands on. And you were going to now go to Flopzilla. Like, what sort of, what would be the mathematical breakdown? First, you have to know obviously how much um, he's he plays from the small blind, how much he c bets. Uh, how mm -hmm. I mean, like, how deep can you go in to analysis? There, I don't know. Is that a dumb question? Um, no, I'm primarily just going to look at the range of hands he's betting in this situation versus how much of it. I think can fold. Um, so if he, so when we shove, what was it? Nine into six. So into six. Yeah. We, so we need to get a fold like two thirds at a time. And so if, and I mean, technically we have a little bit of equity. Uh, let's say if the three, um, non-spade 
um, sixes that give us a straight are good, then that's six percent that we can take away from that. So it's like somewhere around like sixty percent of the time, if we can get a fold, like sixty percent of the time, then I think it's uh, viable. So I will be looking at is this guy betting enough hands on the turn and then folding them versus a shove to meet that 60% threshold. That's what I would be looking for in okay. Flopzilla. Yeah. I was just wondering so like if 18. there's, if you had like a real long chain of equations, like, okay, if this is a guy who opens, who V pips 60% in the small blind when it folds to him. And if you over, I don't know if you call it over C betting and he C bets 70% of the time. Um, then what are his turn frequencies? You know what I mean? How, how much is it value heavy? Um, yeah, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. I think this is where I made the mistake of projecting because I'm probably raising close to a hundred percent here mm-hmm. and I'm definitely C betting a hundred percent and turn barrel. I'm not going to go a hundred percent, but it's probably going to be more than most people, but I'm also using a much smaller size. Than a lot of Bovada yeah. players. If, if they're, if you're in the small blind and the, the other guys in the big blind, if he just calls, um, you're kind of taking a lot of super strong hands out of his range. So that obviously incentivizes because the weak players always fast play their good hands for the most part. Right. And so, yeah, that that would, yeah, I'm not sure. Um, It's just quickly though. It's funny when you talk about like missing a straight or repping a flush, I -hmm. feel like that's cost me about $20,000 in live cash. (laughs) (laughs) Just to show you the difference, like where, um, I mean, I, I jokingly blamed it on Ed Miller because, you know, th- those were like the first poker books I, I read. And a lot of it's just to play like to crush, I guess. The weaker players on um, 2-5, obviously, they just call too much. They're worried about getting bluffed is more than they are getting coolered. So they're, yeah, you rep the flush. If, if they got an overpair, they're calling when the flush hits. You know what I mean? Kind of shit. But um, Yeah, and in your games, they don't have a tournament life to worry well, about. Well, yeah, e- exactly. You just yeah. got you just pay the guy off and, uh, you know. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, but th- this was an interesting one. I think it was a great card to bluff on, but I'm not sure if the guy just has enough that folds in his rage. Not yeah. sure. Yeah, this would be a good one to ask Andrew. Yeah. <laughs> Too bad we couldn't get him on today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Maybe I'll run this by him later, but I probably won't. <laughs> <laughs> right on. Cool. Well, thank you for coming on, Carlos. This is fun. Thank you. This is great. I'm glad you guys are, are doing okay so far. And um and if anything changes with me or with you guys, definitely um let us know. Let me know. Uh. All right. Well, I look forward to seeing you on uh, Marco Polo. Yeah, yeah. So yes. <laughs> did, you, did, you, did you text that to me or is it on uh, I Twitter? I sent the link um, during Twitter. If uh, Perfect. All yeah, right. I, I think it should be pretty easy done, to get yeah. on to, to get. You know, I, don't, I have it on my phone. I'm sure Marco Polo, you can do it um, on your laptop too. I don't know. But, uh, yeah. Yeah, right on. On this last 30 I, seconds. I, I love the app. I'm having fun with it. I got like four different conversations. I got one with the high school buddies. And one with the college buddies and one with the local poker, my local poker friends. And then, you know, Sassanato, Steve, and you and Clayton, hopefully. And then the elites, uh, uh, Carlos, Steve, and, and Clayton. You're right on a couple of those, yes. <laughs> <laughs> careful, though. Circle of trust. You gotta be careful. Yes. Sometimes yes. Steve does these little videos and you can you, you catch a nipple on them. So it's just, you gotta, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> mostly, mostly it's sanitary, but uh, mostly, mostly, yeah. Steve, if you, but, uh, I actually, I actually put on a shirt for uh, for one of those. I was about to do it, and then I got so much ripping last time. For uh, I was like, okay, let me throw on a white beater right here. Sure, we appreciate <laughs> the fact that you don't think your rectal thermometer is is worthy of conversation. <laughs> it, it was either that, or I was going to hold the camera so uncomfortably close so that you couldn't tell that I wasn't wearing a shirt, you know. But right, then I thought, okay. well, yeah. That, that was that was the toughest decision of the day it's, it's creepy either way yeah either way it really is yeah <laughs> you got the uncomfortably close shot or you have the guy without a shirt which would take your pick <laughs> uh, right on well thank you carlos uh if you guys want to uh, sign up for carlos's uh, coaching you can go to heads up poker.info click on the circle of trust uh, tab and he's right down there and thank you for tuning in here is your weekly motivational speech Bye.
of us are being forced into solitude right now in our homes, apartments, wherever we live. But we're also being forced into solitude in our own minds. Life is the most brutal endurance sport of all time. And that's what we have to love about it. We have to flip it on its head and love the fact that life continues to attack us. There are no timeouts. You have to be that person who's always prepared. But the solitude right now that a lot of us are dealing with is what we don't want to deal with. It's the fact that we have to think about all these things that we don't like about ourselves. We like to use life as a big escape. That escape is not there anymore. All these distractions that we use, they're no longer there. Stop looking at me or other people out here to be the hero of your story. Knowing one thing in life, we are all very fragile in this world. We have to know that when we die, we die with some meaning and some purpose in this world.